Magari avvisaci Massimo quando possiamo andare. Okay. Secondo ancora sta partendo YouTube ora. Sì, 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 vai, vai. Quando volete siamo pronti. What am I supposed to do now? Start or wait? Can, can we start, uh, Massimo? Yes, it can. Yes. Okay, so good morning, uh, everyone. Um, so today uh, we have uh, Paolo Giannozzi, who will speak about charge densities and potentials, systems in zero, one, two, three dimensions, Uh, metals insulators, non-magnetic magnetic, uh, versus magnetic systems. So before uh, starting the li living room to Paolo, just let me uh, say a few things uh, um, regarding the organization of, the, uh, of this meeting. So from yesterday experience, uh, we saw, we learned that uh, uh, the Zoom chat is uh, quite uh, uh, ineffective to Uh, for posting uh, questions, because especially if you post questions during the, the, the meeting, during the talk, it is very, very difficult for us to keep track of all the questions. So for today, we would like to try in this way. Uh, please, I would ask, ask you to not write anything in the chat, in the chat um, while uh, Paolo is uh, speaking, because uh, so let's keep the chat clean. Then at the end of uh, Paolo's talk, uh, I will ask uh, if, you, if someone of you uh, want to um, do a few questions on speaking, I can leave, uh, the, I can enable the microphone for one or two questions on voice. So if you have anything to ask, just uh, keep it in mind. And then at the end of the talk, uh, raise your hand. You have the option in the bottom bar of Zoom just raise hand and uh, I will uh, let uh, one or two people to, to, to do the question. Uh, and then um, in general, you can, at the end of the talk, you can write uh, all questions in the Zoom uh, chat. So please let's wait. Uh, don't write anything on Zoom until Paolo finishes uh, his talk. And then when Paolo finishes, uh, write the questions in the chat so that it is easier for us to manage the questions and, and keep track of uh, all the questions. And uh, so, yes, this is, this is all. Uh, so good morning, uh, uh, everybody. And uh, I leave room to Paolo. Please, Paolo. Okay, good morning to everybody. And there is somebody who is who entered the waiting room is, is waiting to be admitted. I, Yes, I'm um, admitting him, but there are some issues, but you can continue. Okay, so uh, we'll ignore the, the message. So, um, as uh, Ivan, while well, Ivan was reading the, the title of my talk, uh, was realizing that I have uh, just collected a bunch of, uh, of, tech, of mostly technical issues. Uh, so my, my talk, today's talk, doesn't have a real well-defined focus. I hope you won't be more confused at the end than at the beginning. Let me show uh, if I manage to the, uh, my screen. So, um, first, uh, the first topic I would like to, to, to talk about a little bit is uh, Fourier transform. You may have heard yesterday, or you may have seen yesterday in, uh, in the hands-on uh, that there is this mysterious uh, fast Fourier transform grid uh, that uh, typically is automatically computed by the code, but maybe it's better if you have an idea of what it is and what it is used for. 
So the basic point is that when you have a periodic function, and we basically always have periodic functions in, uh, in quantum espresso, uh, in a way or another, um, the Fourier components of the periodic function here, uh, it's a simple one dimensional example. Uh, the, the Fourier components are a discrete set, discrete but infinite set of values. Now we truncate uh, this discrete set and we make it a finite set. So how can we deal with uh, uh, these functions in, uh, in a truncated with a truncated number of with a finite number of uh, um, of Fourier components. Now, what happens is that uh, you can discretize the problem both in real space and in reciprocal space, and you may um, associate to uh, to the functions in real space a grid of the function on a grid of finite grid on points and the same in reciprocal space. And you have uh, then uh, a finite set of, uh, of points, uh, both in, in, in the real space and in the reciprocal space, and a mathematical operation called discrete Fourier transform, which is actually the, the real Fourier transform specialized to the case of, uh, of, discrete, of discrete functions. It can be written as I have written here in the, in the slides below. It's a sum of an exponential with uh, um, those, uh, those numbers here, those factors. Uh, the, the, integer, the integer index, index here in both cases runs from zero to, to some capital N. Capital N that must be large enough to accommodate all the, uh, the available uh, Fourier transform, uh, Fourier components in, uh, in reciprocal space. Notice that by construction, both functions, both in real space and in reciprocal space, are, are periodic. And so, um, So you have a sort of fictitious periodicity in, in reciprocal space as well. You may, you actually exploit this fictitious periodicity to refold uh, negative values of vectors of uh, Fourier components. So here you see there are in, uh, in the definition of the Fourier components, uh, there are no negative values, but the negative values are, so to speak, at the end of uh, at the other side of the box. So you have a box in real space, it's your unit cell that is subdivided into points that span the entire, on a uniform grid that span your entire unit cell and, uh, and the same in G space and in, in reciprocal space and the components, the negative components are actually refolded on the side of large uh, values of, uh, of the index. That's because uh, this function is actually periodic, exactly. Function in, in Q is, a, is periodic, exactly as the function in, in R. And this can be uh, generalized. It's quite straightforward, just a little bit boring. Can be generalized to three-dimensional Fourier transform. So you have, uh, you are, you are G vectors, your reciprocal lattice vectors that are generated by uh, making a linear combination with integer coefficients of your basis vectors. Basis vectors are, uh, are the recipro uh, define the reciprocal lattice, so called uh, so called reciprocal lattice, and uh, and the same for in real space. You have uh, a uniform grid that spans the, the, the unit cell defined as, as shown here below. So this, these are the grid points on which we, we know the we, we know our wave function, our charge density on which we, we define our, our, our functions. 
So this discrete Fourier transform, uh, so that the relation between the discrete Fourier transform, the, 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 the variables in the discrete Fourier transform and the variables in, uh, in the original uh, Fourier transform is written here. So from, from the function in real space, uh, continuous function in real space to the three dimensional grid and from the Fourier component, the discrete Fourier component in, into a discrete uh, grid of Fourier components. So those numbers N1, N2, N3, capital N1, capital N2, capital N3, those numbers must be large enough to accommodate all the available uh, Fourier components. So those, sorry, those Fourier components, you have, uh, you have a sphere of, uh, of G vectors, you have Fourier components in a sphere of G vectors and you, have, you must be able to accommodate all those uh, components. Uh, how, how, many, how many components do we have? Well, for the expansion of plane of, of, uh, um, of Consham orbitals, we have plane waves up to the, the famous or infamous kinetic energy cutoff that we, we decide on the basis of our system, of the system we have. Uh, typically, we, we choose it on the basis of the pseudo potential. It's a pseudo potential that typically the hardest pseudo potential that determines which cutoff you should use for, for the plane wave expansion, for the plane wave basis set. But remember that we have also to, uh, we are using this. This technology, this machinery of Fourier, this split Fourier transform, also to compute charge densities and to compute product of, of the potential times the charge the, the, the Consham orbital. This is a, an important piece in the calculation, an important part of the calculation. So, if you look at how uh, the charge density is defined in reciprocal space, the the straightforward definition in terms of expansion coefficient exp of the expansion of Consham orbital. So this would be the sum of a psi square written in a reciprocal space has this form, which is not very practical, but to use it's not actually used, but what you do, you look at, uh, you notice that uh, here in this expansion, there are G vectors up to two times the, um, the maximum G vectors that is present here in the, in the, in the uh, expansion of Consham orbitals. And the same holds for the product of the potential times, times Consham orbital. You need uh, the potential up to the maximum G vector uh, G vector of maximum length that is twice the maximum length of the, of the G vector you have for the in the plane wave basis set that you use to expand the Consham orbital. So uh, finally, well, this means that if you want to use uh, um, the same uh, same uh, Fourier transform discrete Fourier transform grid, we need uh, to um, to use a grid that includes um, Fourier transform G vectors up to a cutoff that is four times the cutoff needed for just the expansion of plane waves of uh, Consham orbitals into plane waves. Okay, that's maybe you have already uh, already heard, so I'm uh, maybe repeating. Notice, however, I'm going to talk a little bit about this later, that uh, for the specific case of uh, called ultra soft pseudo potential and PAW pseudo potential as well, you, uh, you may need um, an additional grid, an additional free transform grid, in order to account for uh, so called augmentation terms in the in the charge density. Also notice that this grid 
sort of cube in the space of, of indices, so n1, n2, n3, n3. Actually, these are the refolded one n prime, and n prime are the refolded ones, and n are the, uh, those that run from zero to, to n minus one. Actually, from one to n, capital N, in, in, uh, in the code, uh, because uh, for historical reasons, actually, once upon a time, uh, Fortran, Fortran arrays uh, started from one and ended to some number. So I was saying in, in this grid, uh, this sort of cube, actually you, you, you will have also some empty space. So you will waste some, some space. So this is a graphical, uh, graphical representation. I think I stole this picture from Carlo Cavazzoni slides some time ago. In case you don't know, I'm, I have a have difficult relationship with graphics. Uh, and with, and with slides in general. So from time to time, I, I steal uh, slides from other people. Anyway, this is, so this is the, the box, the Fourier transform box. And in the case of, uh, um, of Comsham states, only let's say one eighth, uh, approximately a cube, or one eighth the volume of the, uh, the total is actually used while in the case of uh, uh, charge densities or potential, you, you feel uh, with a sphere of G vectors the, as much as you can of the cube uh, or the Fourier transform grid. Um, this is relatively straightforward. It becomes less straightforward when you, when you start to consider how to to execute in parallel and the parallel algorithm is quite sophisticated and has to take into account this difference between the number of the, 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 the space field, in this case and in this case, and number of G vectors in this case and in this case, and in order to, to have a, a uniform distribution of a uniform distribution and a good balance, load balance of, of everything, one has to resort to, to rather sophisticated algorithms. So the, there is a computational advantage in using, well, in using discrete Fourier transform, there wouldn't be such a big computational advantage, but the point is that you can perform the discrete Fourier transform with an algorithm known since uh, many years by now, as fast Fourier transform, which uh, is much faster than the, the, the plain, simple algorithm one can imagine. Um, so the, the plain algorithm would require order of n points squared. So if you have a Fourier transform on a grid of n points, three-dimensional grid containing n points, capital N points, then you the, free the, the ordinary Fourier transform would, would require n square. The fast Fourier transform require order of n log n, and that's enormous. That's an enormous advantage that can be exploited, especially in the so-called dual space technique. So, in the dual space technique, what you do, well, uh, what you need actually in, in most cases are things like uh, most of the calculation is spent in in computing products like uh, Hamiltonian time uh, trial wave function minus an energy. But here the difficult part is the Hamiltonian times the trial wave function. This is the basic ingredient of all uh, calculations uh, uses, using iterative techniques, uh, be it uh, Carpanelli molecular dynamics or conventional molecular dynamics or uh, iterative diagonalization, self-consistency plus iterative diagonalization. And the, the basic ingredient is invariably this object here, H minus epsilon times the uh, a trial wave function. Now, uh, this can be uh, done quite easily uh, 
by looking at the various terms uh, containing the Hamiltonian. So you have a, a term here that is the kinetic energy, and the kinetic energy is simple in, in G space. So let's say you, you compute the G space components, plane waves component here. You have plane wave components. So the kinetic part is simple. This part here, the local part of, of the pseudo potential plus the Hartree potential plus the exchange correlation potentials are potentials, uh, are V of R potentials in real space, the local potential in real space. So you bring the, the conscious orbitals to, to real space, you make the calculation on the grid, you make the, the calculation, it's just a calculation, and the, 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 the multiplication is just a multiplication on the grid, it's a local potential times the psi of R, and then you, you go back to, to, to reciprocal space. The final term here, the non-local term, uh, can be written, uh, can be manipulated in such a way uh, that uh, local, the non-local pseudo-potential term can be written as uh, so, uh, some projectors and it is fast to compute either in G space or in reciprocal space. So that's uh, how it works everywhere. Uh, whenever you can use uh, this, uh, this trick of uh, going to from real to reciprocal space, uh, wherever it is more convenient, execute the, uh, what, you, what, you, what you need in, uh, in the most convenient space and back and go back to the other space, uh, then that's, that's done. That's something that is invariably done everywhere in, the, in, the, in quantum espresso and in similar codes based on, uh, on, plane, on a plane wave basis set. Okay, let's move to a different, uh, to slightly different uh, aspect. So um, you may have seen yesterday that in order to compute the charge density, you have to perform a sum, a finite sum on some set of key points. And these key points are not actually typically given to cover uh, they are a uniform grid typically, but typically they are not given as a uniform grid on the entire pre zone. But uh, they are given, they may be given only what is computed actually is only the part of those, those of key points that are symmetry inequivalent. So you have a set of symmetry operations that. Um, of, of a crystal and you, uh, you apply the symmetry operation to a given key point, you obtain what is called the star of the key point, the star of the vector, so all the symmetry equivalent vectors, and you keep one representative per key point, per, uh, per star, with a weight, the symmetry weight that is proportional to the number of, of points in the star. Of course, if you, if you sum the charge density, if you, if you compute this quantity, it doesn't have, it may not have the correct symmetry. In general, it has the correct symmetry. So what you do is you symmetrize this quantity. So you apply this operation, you, you, you apply the symmetry operation to, uh, to the unsymmetrized uh, charge density sum of our uh, symmetry operation. The, the symmetry operation applied to, uh, to the charge density gives the charge density in the rotated uh, position with all R rotated, with all vectors rotated, and you sum those. So this, this is called symmetrization, and it, it is the reason why uh, we can uh, make uh, all cal calculations only on a, on, the, on a subset of, of key points. Uh, notice a problem that may not be evident. The way the, way the algorithm current works is that 
that you can either provide, uh, ask for a require an automatic grid, uh, and the code will compute the weights and the, and the, and the, and the respective points automatically for you, or you may provide a list of key points. If you do that, you can, uh, but if you do that, remember that the code assumes that what you are providing is the list of key points that are inequivalent by symmetry with respect of the symmetry of the lattice, of the Bravi lattice, not of the crystal. And the code will compute additional, will add additional points if the symmetry is not is lower than the symmetry of, of the Bravi lattice. This is sometimes a source of, conf uh, source of confusion and of, of problems in case uh, you, uh, your list of key points is not given for the correct lattice symmetry. So if you, in case of trouble, use uh, the, the, the automatic grid that the code computes. There is a small utility that computes uh, anyway, list of key points, it's called key points in fact. But uh, it does exactly the same, uh, the same calculation, it does exactly the same calculation, so. Uh, just uh, two, more, two more remarks. There are group symmetry groups that are non-symorphic, so, the symmetry operations are not only rotations, but also fractional translation, fractional with respect to uh, the lattice translation. They, they may be one half, one third, one fourth, one sixth of, of a lattice translation. In that case, you have to uh, just to generalize this symmetrization formula. Uh, this was a source of uh, trouble for a long time uh, because uh, um, this tra fractional translation being fractional doesn't guarantee that the translated grid, FFT grid, overlaps the original FFT grids. So it was a source of, of problem and occasionally still because uh, this kind of uh, symmetrization in real space is still performed for some specific calculations. In, otherwise, what is done, uh, symmetrization is done in, in G space. It's more, it's less transparent and more, more complex, more, less simple, but uh, it doesn't have any problem with, uh, with fractional translations. And also notice, uh, a detail, the charge density as, the, as I have defined here and as it's used in the code is high dimensional. So it's a charge density containing that integrates, if we make the integral of the unit cell of the charge density, you get the number of electrons. You don't get the number of electrons times the, the, the charge. Again, um, I have mentioned before that in the case of ultra substitute potentials, it's also in the projector augmented way, there is an augmentation term to the charge density. So the charge density is not simply the square of the consham orbitals, it's the square of the consham orbitals plus a term that has this form in which the beta and QLM, these objects that appear here, beta and Q, are uh, part of the definition of the pseudo-potential. They are localized functions, localized around the center, around the, the atomic position, the, the ionic position, and they are uh, short range. and give this uh, additional term. This additional term may be uh, somewhat harder from the point of view of, of the Fourier transform than this term. So this term can be easily computed on the Fourier transform grid, uh, as I have introduced before. 
but this term very often, almost invariably actually, requires a cutoff, uh, requires a grid of, of G vectors, because it's more slowly in G space than this one. So it requires a grid of G vectors that is larger than, uh, than the grid of G vectors needed for this part here, for the what is conventionally called the smooth part of the of the charge density, so the, the ordinary psi square. So you have to take into account this fact by introducing a second grid that in, in G space is uh, larger. So you need, in addition to this grid, you need another grid that can fit a sphere in which this radius here, instead of being uh, four times, uh, not the, not the, the radius here is not four times, it's two times. So this maximum length is actually two times. And anyway, the um, The, the sphere of G vectors that, are, that is needed is larger, so you have another Fourier transform grid corresponding to a larger sphere and a larger, and a larger cube. Uh, of course, uh, <clears throat> there is a problem. So in real space, those grids are not necessarily commensurate. So you, you may have, in general, you have different real space points, real space grids that do not, do not, may not have points in common. So uh, when you need to, to bring the things from one grid to another, and of course here you, sooner or later you, you need it because you have this on one grid and, and this on a, on a different one. Uh, what you do is you, you work in G space. So in G space you have, uh, a small, a small sphere for uh, for size square, for instance, and the, the larger sphere, a larger sphere for the augmentation terms. So you, you can uh, the larger sphere, of course, includes a small sphere. So you you bring your g vectors from here to here, and they they fit, uh, and you add what is missing. And then you work with uh, the, the denser real space grid. Okay, so it's, it's a little bit technical, but maybe it's better if you have uh, some idea of what is going on and why also as well. Um, again, charge densities, uh, you may have heard yesterday, you should have heard yesterday, that uh, in case of metals, in, case in, in the case in which you have, uh, you don't have a clear cut distinction between occupied and empty bands, uh, and you have to, and, and sometimes even if you have, uh, you have to resort to, to some uh, method to deal with uh, the Fermi surface and to deal with uh, occupancy that change from, from one to zero in the middle of a band. Now, um, this is done typically, the, the, the most straightforward way of, of doing that is not the only one, there is also tetrahedra, is a, but I haven't, I'm not going to talk about that, about this. The typical, um, typical way to, to deal with metals is to introduce some broadening of levels. So you have a set of discrete Kaunsham levels and you broaden them and you compute weights or occupancies that are fractional objects. So run from zero to one. Of course, they are zero, close to zero, far from above the Fermi surface and the Fermi energy and close to one, just below, below. And they look like uh, an integral of some broadening function with the condition that the sum of our fractional weights, uh, which gives uh, a number of electrons as a function of the Fermi energy, 
is equal to the number of electrons in my system. But one in principle might use uh, the Fermi Dirac, uh, Fermi Dirac protein. Fermi Dirac is, uh, is physical, it has this form. So why not use that? Uh, just use, uh, set uh, some uh, finite temperature, 300 Kelvin, for instance. Now, the problem is that uh, in order to, um, it's not very practical. This is not very practical because you, you need a very high temperature in order to, uh, to be able to use a reasonably small set of, of key points. So the electron gas is frozen. It's in the degenerate state. It's well known. So you, you add uh, that fine, uh, room temperature, uh, very little, uh, very little happens to electrons, so they they don't differ that much from uh, the zero temperature distribution. And so you have to set a very high temperature, and with that very high temperature, this distribution has quite long tails, so it decays slowly. So you have to include many bands above the Fermi energy. It's not something very practical. So one use some other broadening functions uh, chosen with, uh, with the criterion I'm going to, to explain now. Now, there is an important point uh, you may should be aware of. Um, so in the calculation of the total energy, you may introduce, you may take advantage of the sum over one electron, one electron states. So you may write the total energy as the sum over one electron state, so our consham state, consham levels, one electron levels, minus the, the exchange, the, the Hartree energy minus because it's counted twice in the sum of consham of consham uh, energies, plus some other terms. We'll see it later, plus or minus some other terms. Now, how do you compute this term, this consham energy? The typical one would think, okay, we have weights here for the, the charge density. Then we sum the weights times the, the one electron, the one electron energies. Well, no, uh, what you have to compute is actually the, integr the integral of the energy over the broadening functions, which is almost equal to this, uh, to the sum of weights times uh, consham orbitals, consham uh, energies. But there is a small, small difference, a small correction. A small correction that the code prints out uh, calling smearing contribution. And uh, if you do, uh, if you do the math, so if you look at, if, if you do the, the, the calculation of the functional derivative of this energy and this energy, and you in all other terms, of course, you will find that the functional derivative of this energy is the correct one. It's the one that gives, that is minimized by this charge density. And the forces are, derivatives of this energy, not of this energy. So that's why uh, this contribution is actually important. Now, um, broadening functions can be chosen. There is a there are various theories on how to, how, what the optimal choice of, uh, of broadening function. The simplest one is the it's a Gaussian, like this one, a normalized Gaussian. It's not very convenient, actually. Uh, what happens is that ideally you should, you should compute, uh, you should use a broadening delta, the sigma, sorry. Sigma is the object that is called D Gauss in the, in the code. 
and you have to provide it in rate burger. And it's defined exactly in this way. It's a sort of, of fictitious temperature. You, can, you may think that this uh, broadening introduces a fictitious temperature T equal to sigma divided by the, the Boltzmann constant. And you may think uh, that uh, that the energy that you get is a sort of free energy, sort of fictitious free energy functional, the function of sigma. So I was saying it is, in principle, one should use a sigma as small as possible and as, as, few, as few key points as possible. Of course, the two, the two things don't go, go in different directions. So the smallest, the, the, the broadening, the more key points you will need, and vice versa. So it's your interest is, is to use as uh, as large as possible a sigma a broadening. Assuming that you have a given budget for uh, computation, that's uh, uh, what you have to do. If you if you can afford that many key points, then you have to choose a sigma broadening that uh, makes your calculation converge with, uh, with, the, with those key points you can afford. Now, the problem is that uh, this fictitious energy grows uh, as, uh, with sigma as a sigma square. So uh, the difference, uh, the error that it introduces in the energy, the forces in everywhere is not that small. For large broadening, you have a large error as well. So there are these two, uh, these two kind of uh, smart broadening, so called Metzfessel, Paxton, and Marjari Vanderbilt. Uh, Nicola Marjari is a good friend of, of us, so I'm uh, morally obliged to advise for uh, Marjari Vanderbilt co smearing. And those uh, smear, those smart smearing, uh, are devised to uh, to reduce uh, to the, the dependency of uh, of the energy of the fictitious free energy, which of course uh, corresponds to the two energy at sigma equals zero. So uh, they have uh, these two these smart uh, smart smearing uh, techniques uh, have a. Um, a weak dependence upon sigma. So they allow to use a larger, uh, larger, larger values of the broadening. Uh, you may find in this page some detailed explanation by Nicola Marzari. Uh, something that, uh, something that uh, was, uh, was always known about uh, was uh, recently remarked and, and, and finally fixed, is that under some conditions, those uh, smart, uh, smart uh, mesmering, smart broadening functions may lead to, uh, to, bad, uh, to, to a bad choice of the, Fermi, of the Fermi energy. The problem is that those smart uh, broadening are not smart enough to avoid that occupancy may have unphysical uh, values. So physical values are from zero to one. Matvessel Paxton may have negative occupancies on, or larger than one. And Marzari Vanderbilt is non-negative, but may be larger than one, which means that if you, if you look at the, the number of electrons as a function of the energy, that is the function I have introduced before somewhere here. This function as a, this number of electrons as a function of the position of the Fermi energy is not a monotonic function, which means that you may, under some unfortunate circumstances, get a wrong uh, Fermi energy. So there, are, there can be more than two, more than one Fermi energies. That's, uh, that's the point. This has been fixed very recently by, in, by in 
Marzari by collaborator Nicola Marzari. Okay, again for, for charge density, uh, what happens in the uh, non magnetic, magnetic, and collinear magnetic case? In the non collinear, in the non magnetic case, you have all orbitals occupied uh, by two electrons up and down. So you simply have the total charge density as, as twice the sum over uh, the square of, uh, of the orbitals times the, uh, the occupancies. Of course, in case of ultra soft pseudo potential, here you have also the augmentation term. I, have, I haven't written it explicitly because it's, uh, for simplicity, it doesn't change anything. In the case of the in the case of collinear uh, polarization, so the so-called LSDA, local spin density approximation, which is not necessarily local, uh, it's an old name, but anyway, what is important here is not the L but the S. So um, in that case, which is um, the most common case of magnetization, you you have orbitals that have either spin up or spin down. So in, the, in that case, uh, you define a charge density, a total charge density, that is the sum of the total charge of the charge density coming from spin up uh, orbitals plus the, the charge density coming from spin down orbitals. And you have a magnetization, which is a scalar. It's a, the difference between uh, the two n plus minus n minus. Uh, notice also that um, there isn't a spin index in, uh, in quantum space. This is not it's not used. Well, in Carparinelli it is used actually. Um, but in quantum space, in, uh, in the self-consistent code, what we do actually is to, um, to hide the spin, the spin polarization index into key points. So we have uh, our set of key points. We double it. The first set of key points has a consham orbital. We spin up the second set of key points as a consham orbitals we spin down. So uh, unpolarized case, uh, one charge density, one array of charge density, spin polarized scale LSDA, uh, two uh, charge density and magnetization. What happens in the so called non collinear magnetic case? In the, the non collinear magnetic case, uh, in the non collinear magnetic case, uh, we have a plane wave basis set that is composed of plane waves times spin on, so up and down. So basis set is doubled. So you have a vector of components for each orbital that, that have a spin index. So the vector for spin up and the vector for spin down. And, um, and so in addition to the the total charge density, which is simply the sum of the, all the components. There is also a magnetization, a vector of magnetization. I have written here explicitly the, the arrow to make it clear that it is a vector of magnetization, in which the magnetization is computed from the, the, the matrix elements of Pauli matrices. So this sigma here, this vector of matrices are the, the three uh, Pauli metrics. Um, now about potentials, um, something that one has to, to be aware of is that we are dealing with an infinite system, with an infinite system. So some potential terms are, are divergent. In particular, the G equals zero component of the potential of the, of the electrostatic potential generated by the electron. So the Hartree term is by, by uh, construction infinite. 
In fact, if you look at, at, it, at its uh, form in G space, you see that the Hart potential is the charge density in G space divided by G squared times some four pi omega something. But of course, for G equals zero, this diverges. And the local part of the electron ion, pseudo ion interaction also diverges. So the minus, uh, minus Z balance uh, Z times uh, charge square divided by R term, the Coulomb term, term give rise to the interaction that again, it has a form of, of one over G square of Z balance uh, number of valence electron divided by G square. And so it diverges as well. But for, for neutral system, there are no divergences. The potential does not diverge. Other terms, instead of short range terms that don't have this problem of divergence and can be computed quite in uh, a quite straightforward way. And again, something that should be remarked is that those potentials are actually potential energies. So in the code, we use energies. Uh, we multiply the potentials by the charge density, the, the electron charge density, uh, absolute value, not, uh, not with the sign. And, and so they are, uh, they are energies, and they have the dimensions of energies, Lindbergh or Hartley atomic units. This is how the potential look like in a, in a specific case, a silicon. Uh, you see that the potential may, um, may vary quite a, quite, quite a bit. And uh, the sum of the various terms, there are terms that tend to, to compensate uh, here in particular, the electron ion inter interaction potential, the local part here in red, is uh, heavily compensated by the exchange correlation close to the nuclei in silicon. Uh, I haven't mentioned how to, okay, uh, how to, uh, about the exchange correlation potential in this case, actually, in the non-collinear magnetic case, it's quite tricky uh, because uh, um, you have, uh, basically, there are no uh, exchange correlation potential for this form here. So functionals of the charge density and of the magnetization vector. So you have to, uh, to choose a direction. And in each point, you, you choose a direction of the magnetization. You look at the components of the magnetization up and down, and you, you, you use exchange correlation functional of the local charge and the local magnetization. The problem is with GGA in which you have a, you have a gradient and the gradient uh, is not necessarily uh, in the same direction of uh, the local magnetization. So it's, uh, it's quite tricky. Okay, and a, a more, uh, Again, now after potential, let's move to, to energies. As I mentioned before, the total energy can be written as the sum of a, of a one electron energies. That's uh, the term we have seen before. And we've seen before how it can be, it must be computed for metals, minus the Hartree energy, the electrostatic Hartree energy, uh, repulsive energy between, average repulsive energy between electrons. This one, of course, uh, is also divergent. It has a G equals zero divergence. So what you subtract out here is the term without, uh, is the, the energy, the heart energy without uh, that term. Then we subtract out the, the exchange correlation term here, that is not the correct one, and we add back the exchange correlation term, which is the, oh, the, uh, which is the correct one. This is not uh, problematic at all. But then we have 
the energy, electron, electron, in the ion ion interaction energy, of course, again divergent. Again, we remove the divergence by considering the interactions of nuclei in a background, in a neutralizing background. Now, there are uh, several, uh, there are several uh, divergent terms here. So one is here and it's removed. Another one is here, it's removed. Another one is hidden here, it's in the potential. And it's also removed. And, uh, and so all these terms in a neutral system cancel out. Or this divergent term cancel out, and the, the total energy is well defined. Now, um, for a periodic system, um, so what happens is that the energy per cell is well defined, but you can't have a net charge. It's well defined for neutral systems. If the system is not neutral, if there is a net charge on the cell, the energy per cell, per cell diverges. There is nothing one can do about that. More exactly, there is something one, one does about that. Uh, it's just throwing, okay, throwing away the divergence. So you have, uh, you treat the charged cell as, you, as it were, as, it, as if it were um, neutral, for what concerns the divergence term, the divergent term. So, uh, as consequence of the periodicity, net charge on, on a unit cell equal trouble. Uh, second consequence, well, of course, the, pseudo, the potentials have to be periodic as well. So they have a periodicity of the lattice which means that there can be no microscopic electric field. The microscopic electric field is described by potential like, like this with E uh, electric field and it's something that cannot, uh, cannot, be, cannot be present in uh, a periodic system. So no microscopic electronic electric field. More exactly, um, well, there are techniques to deal with them, to simulate a microscopic electric field. Some are based on the so-called modern theory of polarization. Some are um, slightly more tricky. We'll briefly describe one later, especially for uh, slabs in the so-called slab geometry. So when you have a supercell of uh, alternating uh, layers of, of material and empty and uh, of a vacuum in, uh, like, in a, like for a surface. In that case, you may simulate an electric field by adding a potential that, forms, that has this form in the region you are interested in, and then it goes back to periodic, to the periodic form uh, in the region in the vacuum where nothing interesting happened. A more intriguing uh, problem with uh, periodicity is that uh, the zero of the energy, so the zero, actually the zero of the potential, I will show you, the V, the V potential at G equals zero is arbitrary. So, uh, in particular, it has no direct relation with the vacuum level. So, the, the energy, the zero energy of an empty space. Actually, there is no outside. So, the crystal extends periodically everywhere, and so there is no outside a crystal. So absolute values of uh, Comsham uh, eigenvalues, for instance, have no direct meaning. They can be whatever. It depends upon uh, the arbitrary value of the, of the potential, of the zero of the potential. Um, finally, um, 
Also dipoles are not well defined in general. So for a finite, uh, for a finite uh, system, you can easily find the electronic dipole from the charge density. So you just compute R times charge density and end of R. Well, maybe here you want, I should have added the charge, the, the, the electron charge. Well, the ionic potential, the ionic dipole is easy, straightforward. That's it. But in a periodic system, uh, what you compute in this way depends upon what you choose for, for the periodicity. So in this case, uh, we have uh, a dipole here and a dipole here. Apparently here, the, the dipole points uh, to, to, towards the left from minus to plus. But if you look at, at a different choice of a cell, yeah, the dipole points in the opposite direction. Of course, if you are dealing with an, a, a finite system with a, with a supercell, then, then the dipole may be uh, well defined. In that case, you have the possibility to define a dipole by considering only cell that include one, finite, one copy of your finite system. So as long as you have uh, a prescription to divide, to so subdivide your crystal into units, then the dipole of that unit is well defined. The problem is that uh, for finite system, you have a clear prescription in general. In, in this case, for instance, you may assume this as your unit cell or this or this, and they give uh, different values of uh, the dipole. So as I was mentioning before, uh, it's not impossible to deal with charge system. One has to be careful. Uh, you just, actually the code does it automatically because automatically it sets the divergences at g equals zero to, to zero as if for, uh, as if uh, the, the system were near neutral. But uh, what you may find is that uh, the actual value of the energy you get in this way depends upon the choice of, uh, of the zero of the potential. And you may notice that, for instance, in the, the self-consistent code, pw.x, uh, you will get for a system some value. Uh, you look, you, may, you perform the same calculation to the Carparinello code, which uses a different choice of, uh, of the zero of the potential, you get a different number. In addition to the factor two, because the Carpanello code prints results in Hartree and, uh, and the, the self-consistent code prints the results in, in Rydberg. So you have uh, to be very careful not to compare and not to, you can simply compare energies with different charge states. You have to, to resort to some tricks. You have to align the, the G vectors, the, the, the V in the G equal zero potentials, and you have to, um, in any way, the results will, will, will always depend upon um, the energy you, you may, Typically, you have a reservoir of, 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 of charges uh, at a given chemical potential, and then the result, and the stability will depend upon the, the energy, the, the chemical potential of the reservoir of charges. Um, another fact that is, oh, I'm not sure it's really relevant in practice, but in principle, due to this, dependence upon the, the, uh, the choice of, uh, that is dependence upon an arbitrary potential, 
there is no, uh, no guarantee that if you perform a structural optimization calculation in a char system, what you get is sensible. In practice, I have no evidence that this doesn't happen, but it's, there is no guarantee, let's say. Um, now, um, Let's come back to, to finite systems. So for instance, for two molecules uh, treated with supercell and periodic boundary conditions, of course, uh, having a supercell approach has many advantages, but it also has some disadvantages. In particular, you may have a spurious interaction between uh, periodic replicas of, of your system. You are interested in an isolated system in a molecule, you have uh, an array, an infinite array of such systems. Uh, what, what, what guarantees that what you get from this infinite array is valid also for a single one? Well, nothing, uh, but uh, if, the, if, uh, if the isolated systems have no, no dipole or are not charged or have no dipole, the interaction between periodic replicas, the spurious interaction between periodic replicas vanishes quite quickly. It's sufficient to have uh, a few Armstrong of, of empty spaces between uh, periodic replicas and you get basically convergent results. But, uh, but it's, not all, it's not always possible. And in particular, um, in particular, uh, if you have a charged system, it becomes a really uh, problem in case of uh, when you have a, a charged system or even if you have a dipole. So the dipolar interaction between dipoles uh, decays quite slowly and you may uh, notice that uh, in just increasing uh, the size of the supercell doesn't help that much. It helps, but it takes a takes very large supersets. Now, um, there are several uh, approaches. The first two are implemented in quantum express, so the third is not. The simplest one is a, is a correction on the energy in which you use an electrostatic model to uh, take uh, the spurious interactions out uh, from the results, to correct just the energy, which is in principle not completely correct because uh, the presence of uh, periodic images also affects the potential. There's a way to correct the energy and the, and the potential as well by cutting the Coulomb potential in reciprocal space. So um, Coulomb potential is responsible for, uh, for the long rangeness, of course, of the interactions. You, you may implicitly, uh, you may cut off the Coulomb potential and if you cut off uh, the Coulomb potential, uh, what is beyond a given, a given uh, distance uh, is just uh, invisible. So this is the, uh, what is actually done in the, in the third uh, cases, in the so-called Hockney, uh, the so-called Hockney, um, method, uh, you cut off uh, the Coulomb potential, but you do that only in the Hartree potential. You do that only in the Hartree potential because it's the only one that, that, uh, that is long range. So you, when you compute the potential, the V of H, you, uh, you, cut, uh, you cut the Coulomb potential. It can be done in a more simple way also in, in reciprocal space. So you, you, you cut off uh, the, uh, it's equivalent to, uh, to cut off the real in reciprocal space. It's more sort of equivalent. It's called the Martina-Tarkevan approach. And this is actually implemented. Let's see 
the simplest case is in the Markov pain correction. In the Markov pain correction, let's assume that you have a cell, a cubic cell of site L, capital L. So one can study the convergence of a system without dipole, no charge and no dipole. It converges as the fifth power of minus one over the fifth power of the unit cell of the cell side so quickly. With a dipole, it converges as one over the cube of, of, of the length of the side of the, of the cube, so more slowly. And for the charge system, it, it converges as one over L. So it converges never, basically. And this is also difficult. So the, uh, one writes down a correction that has this form. It's a sort of Madelung for charge. If there is a net charge, one removes uh, uh, the Madelung energy of the, the array of net charges. And one removes the dipolar equation in, I hope I've written it correctly. No, I haven't. It's L cube, of course, because this one, it's L cube. And then one finds that uh, the energy converge quite, uh, quite well to much better to, uh, to the expected result. For, um, for surfaces, the surface one you typically uses a slab approach. So you have uh, a piece of surface, a piece of uh, em some empty space, and, and it is periodically repeated. Of course, uh, you have to, to make uh, some serious uh, convergence study with respect to both uh, the dimension of the slab, of the, the number of uh, of, uh, of layers that you consider for, the, for your surface and the number of uh, the, the amount of empty space to leave uh, in order to reproduce uh, an isolated surface. So the, one side of the surface shouldn't see what happens uh, on the other side of, of, the, of the cell. And inside in the middle of the slab, the material should behave uh, sufficiently closer to, to, the, to the, the real crystal. Okay, that's uh, something that one has to, depends a lot upon the, the specific material and the specific problem. One has to, to do some, uh, some specific, uh, some, some convergence, some careful convergence study for this. Uh, this is an example, the recent example I've taken from work I've been, I've uh, also contributed to. And this guy is, is a postdoc at electronic engineering here in, in Udine. He performed the uh, first calculation of uh, gold of a gold surface. So the black one, this is what? This is the potential, potential energy actually, the local part. Of course, you can't uh, represent uh, the non-local part. Average in the plane. So this is a function of, uh, of the Z components, of the vertical components, uh, orthogonal, the surface and uh, the plane. Um, and it's averaged in, uh, in x, y, in the x, y direction. So here you have uh, the gold, and here you have those oscillations. And outside, you see the, the behavior of uh, the potential, it's flat. Notice the values here, electron, the electron volts, and here outside, uh, we are at uh, eight, nine EVs. So the zero is nine degrees, apparently is uh, eight, uh, eight EVs or so. 
But again, this is not important because this zero is arbitrary. But of course, once you have once you have a function, and once you have a slide like that, a slab like that, then you may, for instance, compute the, the work function. So the energy needed to, to take an electron out from here to here, you may average, you may find what the average of uh, the potential is inside the material and then refer the, the one electron states to the average value here. And then you have the energy that is needed to remove an electron from, from the metal and to bring it in the empty space. Now, in addition to, uh, to gold here, there is, after the, the, the first calculation with gold alone, we have added some molybdenum of the sulfide. It's a very fashionable material, quasi by the B-dimensional material. And the intes was in studying contacts with molybdenum of the sulfide on various metals. The molybdenum disulfide is on this side, of course. And now you see that what happens is that this is a polar material, and this polar material produces a dipole. And this dipole can be evaluated by looking at uh, this called dipole correction, or something that the code can compute. One adds a compensating dipole. So if you if you don't do anything. Yeah, the potential instead of being flat uh, is curved. You may add this compensating dipole here in the region of empty space where nothing happens. It brings uh, the, 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 the potential that uh, causes the potential to, be, to become flat again on this side and this side. And this gives information on the actual uh, dipole, dipole that is present on the, on the surface. Uh, okay, I think I, uh, I finished here. Um, something more, something I wanted to also to, to talk about, but I haven't prepared a slide is uh, about application of electric fields, you may, in a case like that, consider, for instance, uh, the black one, the black lines. How can you apply an electric field here on this material? Well, you uh, you add a source of potential like that that in this region, in the region of uh, uh, empty space, uh, of course, it has to be periodic, so it goes down, and then it repeats periodically. So the potential is simulates an electric field here in the region of uh, uh, the material, and then, um, simulate something that is completely unphysical, of course, in the, in the empty space, but you aren't interested in what happens in the empty space. Poten of course, the potential, the overall potential is uh, periodic, and it's made periodic by uh, reverting it in the, in the region of, in a region far away from, from the material. Uh, a frequent mistake is to misunderstand what where the, the, the empty space is and to, and to, give, uh, to give parameters that make the, 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 the electric field to change direction in the middle of the materials instead of the middle of the empty space. So be careful when you do that. Okay, I think I've finished for now. Uh,
Thank you very much, Paolo. Uh, so we have, uh, it's 10 to 10. So I think we have quite, uh, uh, quite an amount of time for questions. So uh, if uh, whoever wants to, to ask a question directly speaking with, on voice, uh, just uh, you can raise your hand. You have the, the button in the lower. Okay, here we have one. So Daniel Torres, please. Um, <clears throat> um, hello and hello. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Professor Genasi, for such a uh, beautiful, calm, and detailed talk. And uh, my question is the next. Um, I, I've read and watched a lot of videos on DFT, and they talk about these correlation problems on, D, on DFT. Would you say uh, this is more of a user or a code problem? Sorry, which pro what I what is exactly the correlation problem? That is the because choice the choice of an excess correlation potential. You mean because because I've read papers they, where they say that this is a correlation problem in in DFT. It's misrepresented correlations ah, between electrons. Uh, mm. Well. Uh, well, it's true that when people don't feel, don't find the correct results, uh, they say, "Oh, it's correlation." And yeah. Well, uh, depends a little bit uh, about uh, the materials uh, for which the, the materials and the properties for which uh, this correlation problem is invoked. So there are uh, some well-known cases of. Uh, DFT uh, failures, or uh, maybe uh, you heard about more about them uh, about that uh, when tomorrow or on when is the advanced functional stuff? Uh, the day after tomorrow, Thursday. Okay, Thursday. Oh. There is a day dedicated to advanced functionals, and of course, when you when when you talk about advanced functionals. You have to, to specify what backwards uh, functional don't get right. And there are a number of, uh, um, of known problems in, uh, in DFT, uh, in plain, simple DFT, let's say. Uh, and, and also of known. Uh, known measures to known things that can be done to, to avoid those problems. So it's uh, one should, should have a look at uh, the specific case. I mean, um, um, for instance, the, the lack of uh, Van der Waals interactions in DFT can in plain DFT, let's say GGA, may be tracked to uh, missing uh, missing electronic correlation, actually missing uh, non local uh, non local correlations uh, between distant between uh, clouds of charge that are uh, do not overlap or overlap in a, in a marginal way. It's, uh, it's more or less known, and it's also more or less known what to do in that case. Uh, use uh, van der Waals aware functionals or add uh, corrections, various kind of corrections. Not sure I ever answered your question. Okay, okay, thank you. Thank you, Daniel. So, uh, of course, now you can write all your questions in the Zoom chat. Uh, I see there is a, another raised hand, Dorie Estera. Please. Hello, uh, 
Uh, good morning from Spain. Thank you for the invitation for this wonderful school and also for this wonderful talk. I was thinking about the clear explanation you did about the child density. And I have seen in literature that often some of these effects are not introduced in the self-consistent cycle. I think, for example, in magnetism or in spin orbit coupling in the case of non-collinear magnetic calculations. Sometimes uh, these effects are introduced in a tie binding model at the end of the calculations. And this, of course, allows to low expensive calculations and makes possible to converge some calculations that are really difficult to converge. So is this a good practice or are we losing something important? Because I understand we would be using a charge density that is far away from the real physics. Um, it's a good practice if it works. <laughs> um, I haven't mentioned this, but non-collinear uh, magnetization is a pain in the to converge. I mean, it's hard to converge. Uh, and also spin orbit. Spin orbit, when you have spin orbit, typically things are a little bit better. A okay, non-collinear magnetization without spin orbit is not that physically not, uh, yeah. not very, very sensible because the, the magnetic isotropy comes from a spin orbit. It doesn't come from directly from, uh, from the exchange correlation function. And, um, but I'm aware, uh, the, the, I don't know very, very well what, how spin orbit works in quantum espresso, but I think it's implemented in the proper way, in a complete way. So, you, you start from a pseudo potential with a spin orbit term, and you perform the self consistency with everything on everything on, the, on all terms that are there. It's expensive and slow to converge, it's true. I'm, I remember that some guy uh, years ago presented uh, an alternative way to, in particular, to compute band, band structure. It was sort of perturbation. And from what he showed, it was much faster and results were quite good, very good. So um, it, might good, it might be a good, uh, good alternative uh, in, in, in cases which you have uh, really convergences. Uh, it's difficult. Okay, thank you. Thank you for your answer. Thank you, Dorian. So I don't see any other raising uh, raised hand. Ah, uh, yes, there is another one, but uh, maybe let's uh, read uh, a few questions from streaming, and uh, and then uh, we will uh, um, have another uh, the, the question from Ignacio. So from streaming, I see there are two quite similar questions. One is uh, what materials will provide the cases where MP or MV smearing will provide a non-unique Fermi energy, i.e. Uh, e. when the materials is uh, uh, X, Y, Z. And the other question, I think it is quite related, how should I decide when to choose fixed occupation, fractional occupation, and type of smearing for bad metals, axitonic insulators with pseudo gap. Uh, case of non-unique for energy, uh, I think uh, uh, the guy who who made the who found the fix will publish it uh, soon. So uh, if you look uh, if you look in GitHub. Uh, in GitLab on the developers portal, there is an issue that now is closed. Uh, I'm not sure I can uh, can I can find it now uh, because it's uh, it's quite old. Uh, this was observed some time ago. Uh, typically, what uh, typical case in, in which uh, some trouble could arise is when you have. Uh, um, 
a single state. What was the case? Uh, that is for true metals, it doesn't happen. It happens, it might happen when you had very few states contributing to the to the Fermi to the to the density of state at the Fermi energy. So when you have very few states, uh, in that case, uh, you, you may occasionally uh, get uh, the, uh, the bad Fermi energy. It's, it's, diff it's not a big problem, but it was uh, sometimes uh, some, some failures have been tracked to, to a problem like that. Uh, about the choice of fixed occupation, fractal occupation, but yeah, the, uh, how should I decide to choose fixed occupation, fractional occupation, and type of smearing? For no, I, I see. It. I see it on the on the chat. Um, well, uh, typically, even uh, even for uh, if it's for insulators, sometimes uh, you need to specify. A broadening because uh, uh, during the self consistency you may have a level crossing, and so you, this will your system may become a uh, metallic during self consistency, or you may have level crossing, and so you you run into trouble with con with uh, convergence, with self consistency convergence. So typically, uh, whatever prob problematic if if you're system is problematic, you have to go for a fractional occupation for a broadening. So we have a, another question regarding exchange correlation potential. Are there some approximations for exchange correlation potential or hybrid functional to solve that term? And the term is meant to be the exchange correlation potential in the conscious Hamiltonian. Mm -hmm. So, if, are there some approximation, approximations for exchange correlation potential or hybrid functional to solve the exchange correlation? Maybe to solve, to solve that term. The, exchange, the term is the exchange correlation potential in the conscious Hamiltonian. So maybe Christian, could you write it uh, better, maybe specifying better which term do you mean? Because it sounds, are there approximations to solve exchange correlation potential? Are there approximations? Okay, so maybe let's try to, to write the question some more, uh, a bit more uh, specific. Uh, and we have another question later. I have two related questions reg regarding the corrections for finite systems with PBC. Could you possibly comment on finite side scaling instead of such corrections? Well, they, both, both are good. Uh, you can use both. That is, you use correction and finite side scaling. Correction help finite side scaling. Finite side scaling with uh, charge uh, systems, well, try and you will realize that it doesn't work. So it, it requires, uh, really, you require so large supercells. But anyway, it can be used, yes. How do I use the yeah. correction already implemented in quantum espresso? Well, this you, one has to, to look a little bit carefully to, to the documentation and to examples. If there are some, there are, not sure there are many examples, but there must be some example here and there for for each of these corrections. Of course, you have to activate uh, those corrections and look at uh, with some uh, flag in the input and you have to, uh, to look at uh, parameters, if there are any. Uh, for instance, for, for the, electric, the electric field, you have to be very careful to uh, where you, you, you put your electric field, your reversal of electric field. 
So we have time for other questions. Another from streaming. Does the charge density symmetrization can be affected by Ibra equal zero? And no, we... in principle, no, because the code anyway will try to figure out uh, what uh, the correct symmetry. In practice, it may happen sometimes that uh, system has trouble in in finding the correct symmetry because uh, what you have provided is almost symmetric is, a, is an old problem. If you, if you have a real symm symmetric uh, material with a no symmetry, you should provide uh, the correct symmetry. It uh, makes uh, life easier. But in principle, it should work anyway. How can we examine the effect of electrons holes? Is it just enough to add, remove an electron? <laughs> no. <laughs> Unfortunately, no. Uh, you have to take into account. Uh, well, it depends on which, ex ex which effect uh, you are looking at. Uh, so effect on geometry with the caveat I have mentioned. Uh, just add and uh, remove an electron and let the system relax uh, with the caveat that or effect on the electronic structure is something that you can easily you can easily see if you remove an electron where where it comes it come from and if you add one where it goes On the conscious Hamiltonian, we have the exchange correlation potential, which approaches are used to solve it. Well, this, uh, well the exchange, uh, actually, I have, I'm not sure, uh, maybe I should have, I should, I should have said that uh, uh, the action, for the action correlation potential, the action correlation potential is a function of the charge density. So, uh, what do you need? You need a local, uh, you have typically local, dens local density part, which you have some function of the local, of the local density. So you, you compute the density, the charge density, and you have the, you compute uh, directly the, 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 the local, for the local part, you compute directly the, uh, the potential. Uh, this, this will be a function in real space that you can transform back to, to reciprocal space if you need it. Actually, you don't. Uh, for the GGA part, you have a function of the local uh, density and of the local gradient, square gradient, or some combinations anyway. This is something internal to exchange correlation potential. So you have the charge density in real space, for instance, because you sum over psi square in real space because it's convenient. Then you go to reciprocal space and multiply by G, and that's the gradient. You go back to real space, and that's the gradient in real space. Then you have the charge in real space, the gradient in real space, and the function that at each point uh, using the, the charge density in that point and uh, the gradient in that point produces uh, the, 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 the excess correlation potential. The more uh, sophisticated the action correlation potential is, the more the passage from uh, charge density to excess correlation potential is, uh, is complex. Is, uh, uh, may, so called meta GTA have an additional term in the Hamiltonian that again must be computed based on the charge density, again with similar techniques. Uh, hybrid functionals are much more complex because they have a non local term that is completely different and must be computed with a rather different technique. But plain exchange correlation functional GGA simply functions of local density and charge density, charge density and gradient of the charge density 
it's something that you you have an input, uh, you, you compute the, the gradient using the FFTs, uh, that's it. Well, the, the, the functions may be sometimes quite complex and sometimes also numerically noisy, especially in empty space when you have uh, the charge density that is small, the gradient that is small, and they should go to the potential should go to zero. It does for atoms analytically. It doesn't for for condensed matter system. Okay, but so the, sorry. that's it. Uh, it's nothing especially complex. Uh, yeah. Are we late? Uh, we have we have uh, two three minutes left. Maybe we can let Ignacio uh, ask his question and then we close. So please, Ignacio. Thank you. Um, I would like to know what would be your approach to modeling paramagnetic phases in DFT. I know it's somewhat ill-defined, and people usually resort to non-magnetic calculations from a paramagnetic material, which I don't find very satisfactory. So what would be your take on this? Uh, what do you mean by paramagnetic uh, materials? Uh, uh, some examples? A material beyond its critical temperature, where the magnetism is not magnetically ordered anymore. Ah, uh, well, something... Uh, it has been said explicitly is that these calculations in principle are t equals zero calculations. Yes, yes, of course. So, um, so you, you, you cannot directly uh, account for the temperature. So you may, for instance, may, you might consider supercells with uh, some uh, random, randomly oriented uh, spin, because this is something that can be done actually with non-collinear magnetism. You can uh, impose uh, constraints on the magnetization. Typically you have to, otherwise the system doesn't converge. So you might in principle take uh, a system and uh, make uh, make a supercell with a randomly oriented spin or magnetic moments. Um, the why, I don't know. One, one can always, uh, typically what one, one tries to do with magnetism is to obtain parameters for an effective Hamiltonian and then use the effective Hamiltonian at high temperature for, and for calculations of uh, statistical, mechanic, uh, statistical mechanical properties. Yes. Okay. Thank you very much. So thank you very much, Paolo. And uh, now we are uh, really late and we have to close. You can still forward uh, your questions in the proper uh, Slack channel of day two. And uh, we uh, meet again at uh, 10.30 for the Anson session from uh, Professor uh, Anton Kokal. So see you later. Bye. Bye, Paolo. Thank you again. Thank you. Thank you. Ivan, we, we stay connected, right? We can stay connected. Yeah, sure, yeah. sure. The, this, uh, the, the meeting is uh, going until the end of the day. So, uh, yes, we... Actually, if you share a screen with... Uh, I don't know if the people from ICDP are here connected. Exactly, yeah. Well done, yeah. Perfect.
Paolo, c'è il microfono aperto. Aspetta, che, eh, no, non okay. sto dicendo nulla, eh. Ok. Era. Vabbè, non... <ride> non... <ride> è che poi uno se ne dimentica. Eh, sì, sì, no, meglio tenerlo chiuso. Pietro, ci sei? No. Sono Paolo, ho detto, ho detto, ci sono solo, detto, solo, detto, solo che qua ci sentono tutti magari, eh, ci sentiamo... Ma tanto no. non devo dire niente. Di, 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 eh, dimmi. No, niente in realtà. Era così. Mm. Eh, no, l'acqua... Cosa c'è ora? Ora c'è il tutorial, c'è la parte in zone che fa tone, e saranno... Cosa si farà ora? Ora ci sarà... Eh, il test di convergenza quindi punti K eh, c'è cut off punti K eh, eh, mm -hmm. c'era una domanda in uh, vabbè sì, adesso ci, gli sta rispondendo Stefano quindi non importa. Sì, ora guardo un attimo anche se eh, boh Let's wait maybe two minutes more. Okay. Can, uh...
Tony, are we going to do some HPC test now? Tony, you are muted. muted you're muted. Wait, okay, can you hear me? Yes. I can maybe just show at the end of the hands-on how tomorrow we will start using it, yeah. Okay, cool. Okay, perfect. Yeah, but then later in the afternoon, I will test all the three machines so that it will yes. be. Yes, consider that the reservation of ICTP is open up to 4 p.m. Today? Yeah, every day. It's open from 6 a.m. to, to 4 p.m. Okay, okay. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, I'm here, so yeah. we can, we can, I mean, I'm, I'm going to be here if anything, if you do anything. So oh, it's 10.30, maybe we can start. Uh, so now, um, Professor Anton Kokal will uh, uh, give the hands-on session um, about uh, uh, SCF calculations and post-processing. Uh, before uh, starting, let me just say a few things uh, uh, regarding the organization. Uh, so basically, uh, from yesterday, we saw that Slack is very effective uh, for the hands-on session. So please, uh, all uh, the participants, uh, please write all your questions uh, on the Slack channel. And uh, the tutors, uh, please uh, check the Slack channel uh, for questions. Because in that way, there are more people who can uh, monitor the, the, the questions. So uh, there are more chances that you get a, an answer. and. Uh, um, yes, so use the Slack channel because we also have threads. And uh, here, if you write here on Zoom, the, the, the chat will scroll down and we lose the questions. Another thing, please remember to answer uh, using reply in threads. So uh, the, the answer will stay bound to the question and uh, it is uh, easy even to, to understand the, the flow of, of the conversation. So for both uh, participants and tutors and uh, whoever, uh, reply in thread uh, whenever possible. And uh, use the, the main chat only to open a new thread. Uh, so for a new question. Um, another thing, one last thing, uh, we have uh, uh, the breakout rooms. As you see, uh, there are four rooms, one uh, per, uh, per uh, tutor. So we have four official tutors for this session. Uh, for the tutors, if you, re you read the questions on Slack and you feel that you can uh, give uh, close uh, assistance to people who are asking uh, questions on Slack, uh, feel free to write uh, on Slack, uh, join to my breakout room. So when the participant uh, reads uh, this, uh, this sentence, uh, you can find here on Zoom, the breakout room menu, menu in the bottom bar, and you just uh, join the breakout room of the tutor who uh, answered you on Slack. So um, I say it again, just for clarity, the participants ask, ask questions on Slack. If the question is uh, tricky or uh, participant need uh, a closer assistance uh, from the tutors, the tutor will read the question and answer, please join to my breakout room. So the participant can join the breakout room from the bottom bar here. You see that the breakout rooms are uh, named after the tutors. So Malika tutor room, Podsberznik uh, Pod tutor room, Sapati Kriya tutor room. Uh, so if uh, one of those tutors uh, answered you, join my breakout room, you uh, come back here on Zoom and enter that breakout room where, uh, of course, also the tutor will join the breakout room and you can chat there and solve whatever issue. So let's try this way, which uh, seems to us to be the most effective uh, so far. Uh, sorry for uh, these, uh, uh, these, these uh, words. Uh, and now Even I, uh, just a very, short, uh, a very short recommendation. This is Stefano Baroni speaking. Uh, uh, concerning uh, the usage of uh, breakout rooms, uh, I would recommend all the tutors to use them as much as possible, particularly for technical uh, questions, technical and uh, seemingly trivial questions, such as um, the location of buttons on the screen, uh, the, the simple, uh, uh, simple uh, setup uh, uh, stuff, uh, 
that is trivial to explain in words uh, and may take uh, several lines and trial and error to, uh, to explain uh, uh, on the chat. So uh, feel free, please, uh, to use uh, at your discretion, of course, but the chat rooms uh, as much as possible. Also, uh, I've seen uh, that, uh, 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 that some questions uh, get uh, uh, multiple uh, answers, uh, which is good, of course, but uh, there's uh, uh, kinds of penalizes uh, the optimal allocation uh, of the tutor's time. Here again, uh, if some of the questions uh, can be uh, discussed in breakout rooms, uh, this uh, would probably uh, save uh, some uh, of, the tutors, uh, of the tutor's time. Thank you very much uh, and uh, have a, pro a, a profitable uh, uh, morning or afternoon, whatever it is at your place, night. Thank you very much, Stefano. So please, Tone, let's uh, begin the end song. Okay, so thank you very much, Ivan, and thank you very much to Stefano for all the explanations. Now let me try to share the screen first. Okay, so can you see my screen? Yes, yes, we can see. Yes. Okay, fine. Okay, so, uh, Hello, everybody. My name is uh, Anton Kokal, known as Tone to colleagues and friends. I come from uh, Josef Stefan Institute from Ljubljana, Slovenia. And the subject of today's hands on uh, session uh, are convergence tests. Yesterday, after the excellent presentation given by uh, Ralph uh, Gebauer, there were a lot of questions on the Slack. Uh, how do I choose a proper set of coin points? How do I choose uh, uh, the proper cut of energy? And so on. And so this, uh, uh, so there is no general answer to such questions because first the answer depends on the system and the answer depends on the context. And uh, so uh, during today's hands-on session, you will learn how to try to give a uh, an answer to such question for a given, let's say, particular uh, system. Okay, so uh, here is the scheme of uh, today's hands-on session. So first, uh, we will make some basic uh, convergence tests for uh, silicon bulk. This is located, I will show later in the directory example one, silicon. So here we will test uh, we will test cutoff energy, we will test K points and so on. Then we will uh, do one uh, metallic system, uh, aluminum in particular. And here we will see this uh, smearing uh, issue that Paolo described uh, uh, this morning. And then we will uh, go to example three, which is iron. And uh, for iron, which has a 3D uh, states, we will use ultra soft pseudo potential and it is also magnetic. And so we will see uh, this uh, kind of uh, how we need to increase uh, uh, the cut of energy for the charge density beyond uh, four times that of the wave function. So there is a lot of, um, there is a lot of uh, examples here. So I'm not sure we will be able to do all, I will be able to cover all in two hours, but nevertheless, uh, these uh, slides uh, contain all the information and so, now it depends, you can follow me when I will do the examples or you can just listen to me and then you do uh, these examples later on. It depends on uh, each particular participants, what she or he uh, uh, thinks is uh, the best for her or him. Okay, now this is uh, something, uh, now comes uh, the point uh, where we will do this more or less every day. We will update, uh, let's say these exercises and to, to do that, I will show later how to do. Uh, Git pool should be sufficient, but if you have changed some files yesterday, then uh, Git pool may fail. And if this is so, then here at the bottom of the, of the page, you have the three commands that you need to do, and then uh, your exercises will be updated. 
Okay, and now I will shift uh, from uh, uh, from these slides, and I maybe just uh, one uh, um, useful information for those of you who are not used to Linux. Uh, so, do you see my mouse pointer? This is a question which is important, I think. Can you see my mouse yes, pointer? Yes, we do. Yes, we do. Yes, we do. Okay. So you see here at the bottom, you have these virtual workspaces. And this sometimes is uh, very useful for organizing if you have multiple open uh, windows. OK, so now uh, this was already described uh, in Friday and uh, yesterday. Here we have these exercises organized in per day basis. So today is day two. And so we can double click this day two and the file browser will open. And now for each, uh, let's say for each day and for each exercises, we have two different uh, sources of information. The first one, which is the, in the top directory of a particular day, they are hands-on slides. So these are the slides I just showed you before the first two pages. But then there is another source of information which is a readme file. And this readme file exists in every directory. So I now jump it into example one, and you see readme file here. So the information contained in this hands-on slide and the readme slide is a bit complementary. So uh, these uh, PDF, these slides, they, they contain, uh, uh, let's say a more descriptive, more explanatory uh, description of uh, uh, the hands-on exercises. Whereas these readme files are more like cooking recipes. It goes like, uh, okay, let me, let me open it. So if you double click it, it will open in a Firefox browser. And so this readme file is more like a cooking recipe. It says, okay, in this exercise, you need to do a calculation A like uh, that, and a calculation B like that, and a calculation C like that. So these are these two uh, information that you have uh, in order to understand what each particular exercise is about. Now, let us do this first, uh, first thing of the day. So we can uh, right click um, on the file browser. Here I have open terminal, and then I will do git pull. So this is the first thing to do. And if git pull fails for you, for me, I am already up to date because I've done this before. You can do git stash, git pull, git stash apply, and this is described on the second page of uh, uh, the of the slides. Okay, uh, now let me go back to slides, and uh, um, the first example is silicon, and here you will see some explanation of the structure of the input file, so you can read this by yourself. Instead, I will go to example one like that and of course if you don't know of or if you are behind me then always you can look at the readme file and there is the explanation what to do and so now i am in example one but maybe before proceeding just a question are these fonts in this window large enough or should i enlarge them any feedback maybe you can enlarge a little bit a, a, a large, a little bit. Okay, let me try if that will work. Okay, now it is a bit larger. Okay, and so here inside, again in this example, silicon, I have several sub examples, a readme file, and here is uh, uh, the input file for the PWX. And we can open it, for example, in Emacs. Or another way is to use a file browser. And so here we can see some uh, name lists, uh, some name lists. And in these Emacs modes, everything that is read means comment. And also this hash here, this means comment for the cards, but is not colored read in, uh, in Emacs modes. OK, so this is the basic structure of of uh, the pw.x uh, um, input file. And uh, so uh, if you are just interested in the name, so what is pw SCI, SCF means, you can go here to, to Firefox 
now because the zoom is running it is a bit slower and then you can go to this how to and you have here the file name conventions and you can read the logic of the how the files are made okay uh fine and so suppose that uh you don't know what a given variable is so we have prepared for you uh we have prepared for you this firefox with the buttons and here if you click pwx then of course for each particular variable you have the explanation for example if i go to the calculation i can see different types of calculations that can be done in the pwx now of course in a virtual machine all this is uh, is um, arranged for you but maybe later on when you will not use the virtual machine anymore suppose that you want this information so how we can do this well we we google it and let's say that i'm interested in the nap uh, description so in the google i would say input nap.html and so the google is smart and the first uh, hit is the description about the net program uh, uh, otherwise this information is also contained on the quantum espresso web page so why i did this uh, nap example is because here you see a lot of buttons but uh, because there are so many of them we did not notice that nap is missing nap will be used next day and so we can just add a nap button so this can be done very simple i just drag this uh, somewhere here uh, but i've done this yesterday for myself and uh, then maybe i can just uh, make a shorter description like that now i have two nav buttons because i've done it yesterday this so i will remove uh, this one okay this is just if you uh, uh, would like to know what a given variable is go to today we will use pw we will use pp we will use bands we will use those and so on and so on you go here and then you find the information now it is uh, it is time uh, to go on and i go back to slides and so uh, one of the first thing uh, when uh, so one of the important uh, thing when we try to model uh, a given system is to input the structure to input the structure and so silicon is in a is a, uh, crystallizes in a diamond structure and so now how do i visualize so here i have a here i have this uh, uh input file or even here of silicon uh so it is ebrav equal to so if you if you will go to this uh pwx description of the input file you will click ebrav you will notice that ebrav equal to means uh means fcc lattice uh okay and in order to visualize this structure and then you can see we have a, we have two atoms in the unit cell and uh this is not means number of atoms and number of type of atoms is just silicon and two atoms okay and we i can visualize it like that x then minus minus pw i the name of the input file and uh so this is the reduction uh, so if I have a crystal is a 3D system, I do not reduce. If I have a surface, I can reduce to two dimension. If, we, if I have a molecule, I can reduce to zero dimension. Now we have silicon bulk, so no redu uh, reduction of the dimensionality. And now this is a, this is a, a silicon structure. I can even display um, atomic symbols. And now I don't see any bonds. And this is sometimes annoying. I just show how you uh, how you can uh, display bonds you go here to atomic uh, to atomic radius and you enlarge the chemical connectivity factor and you press update and now i have the bonds okay but now uh, and very important buttons are here on the bottom this is kind of nicely tessellated unit cell this would be just a translational asymmetric unit a translational asymmetric unit but now is a problem here we can see that there are four eight atoms one two three four four uh five uh one two three four five six seven eight but here in this input i just specified two atoms so how is this possible it is because we are looking at the conventional cell if i want and the coat is smart the coat is smart and uh, uh because the conventional cell is uh, four times smaller now i have just two atoms and this is basically what code calculates 
This is why we just specify here two atoms. Okay. And now to really verify, to, to, to really uh, verify that, uh, that this silicon structure is composed of two FCC lattices, let us play a bit. So I will say number of atoms one, and then I will comment one of the silicon atom. And then I, so I modified the input file. Now I will press reload and I obtain something like this. And here you can really see that this is the FCC structure. So silicon, basically we have two units, two atoms per unit cell. And so basically we have two FCC lattices displayed one with respect to the other. So now I will, I will undo these changes. Okay. So this was a bit of explanation, how we visualize the structure how the FCC structure of this conventional, uh, this interplay between conventional and primitive structure. But now it's time that we do uh, the first convergence test. Now, let me go back, uh, let me go back to slides. Okay, so basically what is here, I now uh, did a kind of a real, real demo. Oops. Uh, Okay, and then here is also some explanation of the key points. And okay, but maybe we can just do the first uh, calculation before we do the convergence tests. And yesterday on the Slack, there was some confusion about this usage. Uh, so uh, this uh, flag means minus input. It can be minus I, minus in, minus in, whatever. Instead of that, we can also use this, um, what is this uh, smaller than redirection operator, uh, but we cannot use both, just this or that. Uh, but notice that this is not recommended on parallel machines because it cannot work. So this is, this minus in is more, uh, is more uh, secure in, because it always works in a sense. So I can copy maybe this, let me see. And I do a simple SCF calculation. And this will be super fast because uh, even with one processor, because this is a really a very simple system. So you see less than one second. Now, okay, this was a simple, uh, simple uh, calculation. And in this virtual machine, so if we would look here, uh, we have this out there and pseudo there. Uh, commented, and there was some discussion yesterday on the Slack. And the reason is that we are using in virtual machine this espresso pseudo and espresso TMP dear um, environmental variables. So um, most of the exercises for today will not uh, explicitly set out dear and pseudo dear variables. And then, of course, uh, you can also do something like that to see in the in the temporary directory. Uh, oops. Oh, well, it didn't copy well, okay. But uh, now you can see this is the temporary, uh, these are not quantum espresso files, but here these are quantum espresso, uh, let's say scratch files that uh, quantum espresso has written in the directory. Now you see doing a, way, a single SCF calculation is very, is very easy. Uh, but, and then we can also grab uh, the total energy from the output file. We can read the, uh, the output file directly. For example, uh, if I want to, so I, I can create the output file. Oops, like that. And then I can read it. But of course, I can, instead of that, also grab for, let's say, for the total energy or something like that. And this is described here uh, on this page. But now uh, let us uh, go to convergence tests. Uh, and so the first, so this, uh, the logic of this first exercise is the following. Let us do the convergent, convergence tests with respect to basis. That is with respect to kinetic energy cutoff. This is the variable E cut uh, wave function. Then let us do the convergence test with respect to K points. This is card K points. And then with the converged uh, cutoff energy and K points, let us calculate the lattice parameter of silicon bulk. And then the bonus would be that once we uh, determined these, uh, let's say converged parameters, we can uh, calculate the band structure of silicon. Now, 
how uh, uh, how one typical does convergence tests. That means if I want to do a convergence test with the cut of energy, I need to pick a given cut of energy, let's say 16 Rydberg, do a calculation and then collect the total energy. Then uh, change input file, uh, set cut of uh, to 20 Rydbergs and repeat the process, collect the total energy and so on and so forth. And so this is very tedious to do manually. And so nobody does this manually. And so for this reason, we use scripts, which will automate the process. And what concerns the scripts? I would say traditionally, uh, unit, uh, Unix shell scripts were uh, used to this end. And here is uh, such, uh, I hope, uh, I only hope that these characters, they are very tiny. They can be seen uh, via the zoom. If you cannot see those characters here, which are tiny, then, okay, look to slides yourself and you will be able to see. So this is one such Unix shell script. So it's a loop over the cutoff, uh, different cutoff values, 12, 16, 20, 24, 28, 32. And uh, 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 then here you see this e cut wave function equal dollar e cut. And so we do a calculation and then we collect, uh, we collect uh, the energy in a file. So uh, this, uh, I remember when I was young, when I started to do calculations, this uh, syntax of shared script was quite, quite, quite awkward for me. So I did not understood at the beginning what this is. There is another possibility, and that is the PWTK scripts, and they are cleaner in a sense, and they are, they are uh, shorter. And today we will mainly use PWTK scripts. And so the logic of this PWTK script is the following. Here we have this load from PWI, which means load from PW input. We load the input file. Okay, here we then open some file where the results will be written. We do a loop over the cutoff, uh, over the cutoff um, values. And then we just set this cutoff variable and we run the calculation. Then we grab with this command uh, the, the total energy uh, and that's it and that's it and so i think this is in a sense much shorter and much cleaner than uh, the shell scripts and today we will use this pwtk scripts now if i go uh, so i can i can go to example one e cut if i go here inside i will you know i go to first to the classic if I go here inside, I see this e cut the function script that you saw before. I will just use different color in order for the script to be uh, no, just the other way around to be better seen on the screen. So this is the shell script I I have shown before. Now maybe with a bit, uh, uh, with a bit uh, larger uh, characters, and this would be then uh, the PWTK script. So if I do ls, I can see this PWTK script. So is a bit is a bit longer than before because here we have some comments, these red comments, and uh, uh, due to that it is a bit it is a bit uh, longer. And here we have this sec command. So to, for those of you who do not know what sec is, this is uh, also a Unix command, which gives you a sequence of numbers, something like that. And so this sec will just go 12, uh, 16, 20, and so on. Okay, and uh, uh, so you see a loop over e cut values, we set the e cut wave function uh, variable, and then this run pw is a command how to uh, run uh, the PW uh, executable in PWTK script. And now I will execute that. And this is, so the calculation is running. It is quite fast. Okay, and so this is my result. And so now we have, let's say the first, uh, the first answer. So what would be uh, the um, sufficient cutoff? Suppose, let's say that uh, there should be, let's say the total energy converges 
slowly, maybe other properties uh, sometimes can converge faster, but let's say as a rule that the, I should be converged between uh, Mili, Rydberg or so per atom. Here I have two atoms, which means that more or less, let's say from 25 Rydbergs on is more or less okay. So you can see a very low cutoff. You know, first it changes very rapidly the energy and then it uh, saturates and it, it, it converges. So and now I, I, can, I can remember uh, this value because later on I will use this value, uh, this cutoff uh, value to calculate the lattice parameter. So maybe something like 25 or, or 30 liter should be more than sufficient. Maybe just because I've shown you this PWTK script, I go here. And uh, so here you uh, is a basic explanation of the logic be be between, uh, behind this PWTK scripts. So I'm sorry because maybe we are really confusing you because uh, those of you who are new to quantum espresso, they are struggling with the input syntax. Uh, uh, and now we are uh, adding on something on top of it, but I think there is no rest, um, 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 rescue from, for, from that because if we want to do a convergency test, we need to do to run a lot of calculations and scripting basically is the only uh, uh, reasonable possibility to do. So here you can see this would be a quantum espresso input on the left and on PWTK uh, script, the input is uh, specified very similar. The difference are here we have these curly braces and uh, uh, then in uh, PW in the terminal is uh, run like that. In PWTK script, we run PW.x uh, uh, calculation like we run PW command. And from the terminal, uh, the script is executed like PWTK and the name of the PWTK script. Uh, of course, then here on, you can read uh, more information about the PWTK scripting. And then at the end, you also have the web site. Here we have the explanation of the commands that we will use today. Load from PWI, which is load inputs data from the existing PW input file. Then uh, this PWO dot N uh, returns the converged total energy from the output and so on and so forth. And then uh, if, uh, if we go to a Firefox, if we go to a Firefox, you also have this button here and here you will see the information of the PW of the PWTK. And may, maybe if you are interested, if you want to learn, here is a way is a way to go. You click this documentation and then you follow follow these instructions here. Okay. Uh, now, uh, so we've done the first test. So we see that some uh, twenty five or thirty Rydberg is more than enough in, uh, for this case. And now let us go to a second example. So I can go one directory back and we see that the same second example is K points. Uh, so uh, of course then in each directory you have these readme files so you can read uh, what uh, should be done with this exercise but I think it's pretty obvious. We have this K, point, uh, K points script inside. So let me, let me open it. Let me open it. And so what we have here, we load uh, input uh, from some existing file, which is one directory back. And then we will scan, we will scan over the K points two, four, six, eight. This two, four, six, eight basically means you can see here, so uh, K points automatic, and this automatic is what, what pa Paolo described this morning, that there is this automatic feature, a feature which constructs um, the K point mesh for you. And then it, uh, the code just uses the K points in the irreducible wedge of the Brian zone. And of course the code know, uh, knows how to calculate the width of a particular K point. And so basically this K2 means two by two by two uh, K mesh, and uh, we use shifted K mesh. So this means one, one, one. And okay, and then we collect the total energy and at the end we plot uh, the result with the blue point. So let us, let us run this script. So now you see two, four, six, eight, and now I have the result. And so what does this result tell me? You can see how the total energy behaves. 
So for the here is the total energy for the two by two by two mesh. And then you can see that from four by four by four on the total energy is more or less converged. So the answer for the silicon bulk is four by four by four K mesh is enough. And now we know that something like, I don't know, 25 Friedbergs and four by four uh, by four K, K mesh is, uh, 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 is okay for silicon bulk. With doing that, with, uh, with finishing the first two examples, we can go to example three. And this has some, um, let's say, maybe not so clear name, ALAT. ALAT stands for A lattice parameter. And so now you know what ALAT stands for. And so the purpose of this exercise will be to uh, determine the lattice parameter of, uh, to determine the lattice parameter of silicon bulk. Now, uh, so here we have the script which is prepared. So let us open it and let us read it. So again, the um, logic is the same. We load the input uh, from uh, this uh, pre-existing input file, but now let us uh, read the, the comments. Here it says, please uncomment and insert value as determined in the ECAT wave function exercise. So I will uncomment this and let me say, okay, silicon is a super fast example. Maybe I can take 30 readers or even maybe 25 would be more than enough. Please uncomment and insert values as determined in the K points exercises. And we just saw that for uh, the silicon bulk, four by four by four shifted mesh is more than okay. And now I am more or less ready. And so here you can see for each alat. So is a loop over the alat is parameters. And so we use this seek sequence. So we will scan from 9.7 uh, bars to 10.7 bars with the step of 0.1 bar. And so we see that for uh, each alat we set in the system the cell DM of one, basically, which is uh, for, which is basically add lattice parameter in four units. Then we run the calculation and we collect the result. Then we will plot the result with the, with the GNU plot. And then, and then at the end, we will also execute the EVX code. EV means energy versus volume. And this EV will give us, uh, will give us, uh, will determine the minimum of the E versus uh, lattice parameter curve. So we'll, it will give us the lattice parameter and it, it will also give us the bulk modulus. And uh, okay, so I think it's uh, is time that we run this uh, example. So we say PWTK, ALAT, and so we go 9.7, 9.8, 9.9, 10, 10. So let us wait a bit, we go to 10.7. 10.7, so all, all, almost done. Okay, so this is the result. This is the result. And so you can see that the lattice parameter should be uh, around 10.2 bore. And now let, and in order to get rid of uh, this um, GNU plot window, either uh, press uh, this uh, X or you just press enter in the terminal. And now this is the output. This is the output of uh, the EV command, which was run here. And so here you can read this output of the, of, uh, sorry, the output of the EV.x command, equation of state. So the, e, the input was here. You can also run this code uh, from the terminal. It, so it will uh, ask questions and then you can answer. So we have chosen Moore-Nagan equation of state. And this would be, the lattice parameter in uh, bar, this would be in atomic units in bar radius. This would be the lattice parameter in angstroms. Uh, this is uh, the bulk modulus. Here you can see uh, lattice parameter and the calculated uh, energies, the fitted energies. Here is the pressure and here is the enthalpy. And now just um, a homework. So if you compare the total energy and the enthalpy, you can see that uh, if uh, the lattice parameter is smaller than the equilibrium lattice parameter, 
then uh, the total energy has a lower value than enthalpy. But if we go beyond the lattice parameter, so then you can see that total energy is, uh, uh, has higher value than the enthalpy. And so the homework is, you need to figure it out why this is, this is so, okay. So with doing uh, this, I think we have completed the first exercise. So the first um, convergency tests. So we now know the cutoff energy, we now know the K points, we know the lattice parameter, and now we can do bonus material, which would be the band structure. Now, uh, for the sake of time, I will skip this example. It is a nice example, but I will just uh, tell you how you do it. So you read this readme file, and this readme file will instruct you to edit these bands, PWTK script. And so here you will insert the lattice parameter. You will insert the cutoff, uh, the, the wave function cutoff, and then you will insert the uh, key points. And now here you see uh, a remark. Uh, I, so the script is suggesting you to use a non-shifted mesh. And yesterday well, there was some discussion uh, when uh, we use shifted mesh and when we use non-shifted mesh. And so in general, I would say we use shifted mesh, but, or maybe I should do the example, uh, but, uh, but if we want to plot, let's say, uh, uh, the density of states, it is maybe better to use non-shifted uh, K-mesh because uh, those critical points like gamma X, so in the center of the Brian zone and of the edge of the uh, Brian zone, these uh, high uh, symmetry K points, these are basically kind of a critical K points. And usually uh, let's say uh, the bottom of the band and the top of the band is uh, these critical points. And uh, if we do not, uh, if you shift that mesh, we will miss these points and uh, then uh, suppose that you want with, uh, to get an idea from uh, the density of states plot, what is the band, uh, band gap? If you don't, do not include these uh, critical K points, then you will uh, get a wrong number for, uh, for the band gap. So let's say for the density of states, uh, it is uh, maybe better to use a non-shifted uh, mesh. Uh, if you do this example, and uh, if you first use uh, shifted K-mesh and then the band structure will be plotted, you will notice, uh, uh, and you compare the Fermi energy, you will notice that the Fermi uh, energy uh, um, extracted from the shifted K-mesh uh, uh, will uh, be somewhat lower than, uh, uh, let's say, the eigenvalue, which should be occupied at the gamma point. So you will figure this out by yourself if you will do the example. Okay, so with doing that, this, uh, I think it's time we go to the second example, which is aluminum, which is aluminum. Uh, now let me just check the slides, whether I did not forget uh, something. So here you have all these explanations, also the plots. And maybe here I have this, uh, uh, this plot, this band structure, oops. This band structure plot of silicon, and you see this is a gamma point. This is uh, K000. And if I do not include a gamma point, so if I don't do not use uh, shifted, uh, uh, non shifted K mesh, I would miss this point because the mesh would be shifted. So you see, this is kind uh, for this silicon, we have the bottom of the, of the occupied band and the top of the occupied band at, uh, at the gamma point. Okay, now let us go to aluminum, which is a metal. And, uh, okay, so this would be the basic input file. We look, look at it. And if you look at this uh, in uh, this uh, directory at this input file, now we will notice these new variables, occupations, smearing, and the gauss. And so this is now uh, how to deal with these uh, discontinuities of metals, because we have a kind of occupied occupied states, and then there is no band gap, and then at sudden uh, from Fermi energy on, the states are not anymore uh, occupied, and this makes problems. This makes problems with the integration, and one should use a very, very dense K-mesh, or one can use a less dense K-mesh and uh, smearing, 
and uh, of course, Paolo explained this morning this uh, business. And so the example that we will do is that we will do a kind of a convergency tests. It will be three-dimensional. So we will, uh, we will uh, scan over K points, over D Gauss value. This D Gauss means how much, uh, 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 sorry, yeah, D Gauss means how much we smear and smearing means which type of smearing we, uh, we use. So this is a three-dimensional scan and it will take a while. And so here is a snippet of the PWTK, how this is done. So it's a scan over the, the key points. Then it is a, a scan over a deeper, different types of smearing, Gaussian smearing, Metfessel Paxton smearing, and Marzari Vanderbilt smearing. And then there is a scan over different the Gauss values. Now let me first open. Uh, let me first open uh, the input file. So this is the input file. And oops, okay. And these are these new variables. These are these new variables uh, that uh, before we didn't have with uh, silicon. And I think by the, the rest should be more or less, uh, you should be familiar already with now. So atomic species, aluminum, atomic position. So aluminum, again, is FCC, obviously, E brav equal to one atom, but zero, zero, zero. And here are the key points, the key points. Uh, and now I go to example one, the Gauss. And OK, here are the explanation. And this would be the script. So let us open it. So you see, OK, now it's a bit longer than uh, in, uh, on the slides because there are some comments. And OK, so you see a scan over key points, a scan over different type of smearing, a scan over different the, the Gauss values. And now this script take a while because it's a three-dimensional. And so there, there is quite a number of examples to run. And uh, OK, so maybe maybe we just wait for this to finish. It should not take more than several minutes, I suppose. And in the meantime, let me check the slides. OK, yeah, here will be the result. And so let us, uh, now I am at K.12. I can read here, and K.12 is here. So I am, but of course, each next is a slower calculation because there is a large, the number of K points goes up as we go from four to eight to 12 to 16. And maybe in the meantime, while this is running, I explained a very, uh, let's say, uh, one feature of PWTK. Because usually when we scan these uh, parameters, maybe we do not know in advance what would be the proper range of a given parameter to test. And then if this is the case, the PWTK is smart in a sense. And so uh, you see this comment here. What I can do is I say restart true. And then I can add uh, some, uh, I can expand the range of, uh, of, uh, of uh, a given parameter. Let's say just for the sake of example, that I will expand the range of the Gauss and I will add here 0 0.15 and 0 0.2. Now I will not yet save the file. And later on, you will see how PWTK deals with uh, uh, such case where we add, uh, where we expand, uh, Mm, let's say a range uh, of scanning of a given parameter. Okay, now this is the first result. This is a Gaussian smearing. And so this would be results for the four by four, uh, came four by four by four K mesh. This is result for eight by eight by eight K mesh. This is result for 20, uh, 12 by 12 by 12. And this is 16 by 16 by 16. And so the first thing, here are several thing, things to notice. The first thing to notice is that for metals, let's say for aluminum in particular, four by four by four K mesh is not okay because you can see, you remember before for silicon, four by four by four was already perfect. 
Here it is not. You can see that the total energy for four by four by four is sufficiently um, different from these more dense uh, K-meshes. And then you can see that as we increase the smearing, these curves come together. This is, this is um, why smearing helps. So with the smearing, uh, we, if we use a sufficient smearing, maybe we can use coarser K-mesh. So you can see how this difference between, let's say, four on the other curves goes down, and also how the difference between eight and this very fine K-mesh goes down as we increase the smearing. But as Paolo explained this morning, this Gaussian smearing, um, the total energy will be affected with this smearing temperature quadratically. And basically, this is uh, what you are seeing here. Now I can, so here it says press enter in the terminal for the next plot. If I do this, now I have a, a marzari Vanderbilt smearing, and this would be the previous Gaussian result. Now you can see, because now this marzari Vanderbilt is what Paolo referred to as smart smearing, which was devised um, uh, to, um, let's say, be less dependent on this smearing temperature. And in fact, you can see that particular for this, uh, um, uh, let's say, 8, 12, and 16, how flat it is with respect to the smearing. And you can also see this uh, 4 by 4 K mesh. When we increase the smearing, this, uh, let's say, difference uh, gets smaller and smaller and smaller. So it's smearing, the, the message would be with smearing, I can use coarser coarser key mesh. And now I press uh, enter again. And here I have a um, Metfestal Paxton uh, smearing, which is another type of this smart smearing, as Paolo referred this morning. And you can again see it is uh, much less susceptible to the smearing uh, than uh, the, Gaussian, the Gaussian smearing. OK. And now, in the meantime, I prepared the script where I will expand the range of these digos. So I added two new values and I say restart equal true. And now, okay, I need to save it. If I rerun the script, you can see that PWTK is smart and say some jobs are already done. And so it will do only those which were not already done. And so this for the convergency tests can be quite a useful feature. Now this should be much faster because we we have just two the Gauss values to calculate over these different types of K-mesh and different types of smearing. So I'm at K points, uh, K-mesh 16 by 16 by 16, which means it should be over soon. And now, of course, I really used very, very large smearing. This was just, let's say, as an example. This 0 0.2 Rydberg of smearing, this is, uh, this is quite a high, high value. OK, so this is Gaussian. You see it even goes outside. With this such a large smearing, it goes outside uh, the range. Now, this would be Marzari Vanderbilt. So you can see it is flat up to a given point, And then it starts, uh, the energy starts, um, starts um, deviating from. Uh, and then if we go to a Marzari, um, so this was Marzari Vanderbilt. And now we go to McFez and Paxton. We can see that, in fact, it is more or less uh, for this uh, denser key mesh, it's flat up to 0 0.2 Rydberg. So, but this is really going too far. And so what would be the message? The message would be that uh, one can use, uh, one can use, for example, for aluminum, some smart smearing, uh, so smearing like Marzari Vanderbilt or Metfessel Paxton with a smearing parameter, let's say something in the range of uh, 0 0.01 to, I don't know, 0 0.05 Rydbergs. You can see here it is, it is quite, it is quite uh, flat and uh, Maybe uh, this eight by eight by eight, you can see how it uh, goes towards denser, denser key, uh, the result of the denser key mesh. And maybe for aluminum, I don't know, eight by eight by eight K mesh is, it depends on, on the economy. If you want a faster calculation, you can use it. But if you want a very good calculation, uh, you would use something like 12 by 12 by 12 K mesh. Okay. 
So with, uh, with uh, this, we have uh, finished um, this um, uh, example. So we can say that uh, we can use, uh, I don't know, 12 by 12 by 12, or if uh, we want to make it calculation a bit faster, maybe eight by eight by eight and smearing something like, I don't know, 0 0.02 or 0 0.03 or 0 0.01. And now we can go to the next example. And now this next example is not about, uh, about um, convergency test. It is about post-processing. It is about how to plot charge density. Uh, so this CH dense, uh, this is uh, CH dense stands for charge density. Okay, and now let me just shift back to slides. So here you see these results that we just saw for the aluminum. And then here is the description how to plot the charge density. And the scheme to plot the charge density in quantum espresso is first make an SEF PW.X calculation. And then with the post-processing code PP.X, uh, we calculate the charge density. And then of course this charge density is written to a given file and we can use some visualizer like x to plot the charge density. Now, uh, this you see for the charge density, we have uh, in the pp.x uh, some uh, parameter which is called plot num. And this is equal to zero means charge density. And this plot num can go, I don't know, from one to about 20. So it's a code. And maybe this code is sometimes uh, difficult to remember. So what is plot num 12? I have no idea what is plot num 12. But suppose that I want to plot a given property. And uh, here it is this uh, graphical user interface that is very, very um, useful. So PW GUI. So I open it. So this is usually how I do. Then I open a blank pp.x input file. And here you see I have this plot num. And suppose yesterday we did uh, psi square. So I click psi square. And then I can go here to view input file. And you see that for psi square, the plot number is seven. So this is, I when I do post-processing, I always do like that because I never remember uh, what this plot number codes. The other possibility is <coughs> to go. The other possibility is to go to description. And then I go to plot num. And here I have the description of the plot num. So this is the other possibility. And then of course, okay. Uh, with this, uh, now we will do a charge density. So I uh, click on a charge density, but then I need to specify the plot. And so here are some data. So dimensionality of the plot, I say 3D, format of the output. And here I would say X crease then X of a format, whole unit cell, because this is super fast. If you do 3D with this, this is a slow option because here, uh, basically fast Fourier transform for calculating the density will not be used and this will be super slow. This here basically in this uh, fast option, uh, PP just dumps uh, the density which is already pre-calculated. And now I can look how the input file looks like. So you see, uh, I have plot number equals zero and then I have the plot name list. And I have one file, so the weight is one, if lag three, so this if lag, this is uh, dimensionality of the plot. And then format of the output, five means X of a uh, fast format, because this will be really calculated quite, quite um, rapidly with this. Now let us look, let us look. Now I have too many windows. It's a bit difficult to, because I can just share one screen at a time. And here we have two examples. One will be charge density plotted with, uh, with the use of uh, pseudo potential and the other with the pop potential. Uh, so it's a nice exercise, you will notice the difference. Uh, okay, so here you will need to insert some values. And then here you can see that this is the input for the PP. And if I look here, if like three, if like three, output format five, output format five, and then the file out is where to plot uh, the charge density. So it will be plotted in the file chdense.xsf. And then the script will also execute exclusively. With the same uh, 
with the same trick as yesterday with uh, with the these uh, orbitals uh, with these orbital densities. So there is a kind of a state script prepared. So uh, it's then will immediately open and make a nice picture. Okay, uh, so here uh, 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 the comment says, please insert smearing the Gaussian K points. So smearing, I don't know, but very wonderful. Uh, D cars zero point I don't know zero point two that should that should be okay. K points. Now I think I can afford twelve by twelve by twelve. This will be fast anyway. And now I run this script. So now it's uh, doing SAF calculation. Now it's doing post processing calculation. So just uh, to uh, the scheme again, first we do SCF calculation in order to calculate, uh, to, calculate uh, to have a self-consistent field solution. And then the PWX uh, dumps uh, files to the out there where there is a charge density by function and so on and so forth. And then with PP, we wrote, read these files and uh, in PP we instructed the code, okay, I want charge density and I want charge density to be plotted in 3D with uh, X Chris then format. And okay, this is now the charge uh, density of aluminum. And you will notice that there is no charge eh? because black means no charge. The, the brighter the color uh, means uh, the more the electrons are there. And you will notice there is no electrons around nuclear, nuclei. And this is due to the use of pseudo potential. So we will remember the talk of Ralph Gebauer yesterday about these pseudo wave functions. And so the answer uh, uh, why this is so is there in this talk. And so for those of you maybe who are puzzled can go back and they will realize why this is so. And uh, okay, so this is uh, this was just uh, here what we see is a is a plane is a plane uh, expanded on uh, what is it four by four unit cell of of aluminum. So maybe just to really give you the impression that uh, this is a crystal, but now we are looking at, at the primitive, right? Because the code calculates the primitive. This does not give the impression that this is FCC, right? Because the code uh, calculates the charge density in the primitive cell, which has just one atom in, in the cell. And this primitive uh, cell of the FCC is four times smaller than this conventional, very nicely, let's say, tessellated unit cell. Okay. Uh, now, if we go back to slides, you will notice here, and um, then the example, there is another example. So I now run this one uh, CH dense. There is also example two CH dense, or no, how is it called? Two CH dense PO. And here we will use PO potential. And uh, so uh, one warning. When we will plot uh, with this example, we plot basically what we plot, then you will find out this by yourself. Uh, we plot um, all electron valence charge density. So let's see what the number is this. This is 17. And here I can see 17. Maybe I should open it in Emacs. So the first is all electron valence. You see plot number 17. And then uh, we will also do all electron charge density. So valence plus core. This is possible with the pole. And what number is this? This is number 21. So if we go down, you see here plot number 21. And but there is so when we use these features, we uh, should use a very large uh, cut of energy for the charge density. Because if you look here at the charge density, you can see these oscillations near um, the nucleus. So remember the plot of Ralph uh, de Bauer yesterday. So there are, there are these wiggles near the nucleus. And to describe this with the plane waves, we really need a huge uh, number of them. And this would be the 
all electron total charge density. And now we really see that uh, because the aluminum, so uh, let us open the periodic table, aluminum has a uh, 10 core electrons, right? And so the, these are located around uh, the nuclei. And so because uh, in order to describe this, we need a large cutoff. So here it is a 500 Rydberg, but typical, uh, typically when, uh, when uh, uh, I uh, use these features and when I want to calculate the bother charges from, for example, from, from this, uh, from this uh, all electron charge density difference, I typically use uh, 1000 Rydberg or so. Here I, uh, the example uses 500 Rydbergs in order to be a bit uh, faster. But this is something that needs to be tested if you want to calculate the bother charge, for example, where you need this four potential and uh, all electron charge density, you need to test uh, what cutoff uh, uh, should you use for the charge density in order to obtain the converged bother charges, for example. Okay, and then later on, you will also run this example and you will obtain a picture something like this and something like that. Okay, now we go to the last example of the day. And this is, uh, this is uh, iron, this is iron bulk iron and uh, we can, if you look at the periodic table we see iron has 3d states and you will remember the talk of Ralph Bierbauer yesterday 3d is uh, nodeless which means that if we would use uh, um, neuron conservative pseudo potential it would be quite hard and it, Ralph has very nicely explained yesterday this uh, let's say um, smart idea of the ultra soft pseudo potential. And for iron, of course, we will use ultra soft pseudo potential. Now iron is not an FCC, but it is a BCC structure. And a BCC structure has E brow equal three. Again, uh, so what are these numeric code for the E brow? So we go, we go to the Firefox, to the pw.x explanation in the system name list E brow, and you can here see all these codes for the EBRAF. Zero is a free lattice. One is uh, primitive cubic. Two is FCC cubic. Three is BCC and so on and so forth. It's quite a number of uh, lattices here. Okay. And then uh, what we will notice, not only that we will now use ultra soft pseudo potential for iron, but iron is magnetic. Everybody knows iron is magnetic. And because it is magnetic, we will uh, notice a new variables in the input file. And these are n spin equal to, which uh, is calling for, uh, which is, uh, let's say, uh, turning on uh, spin polarization. And then we need to set starting magnetization. We need to give to the code some input guess. Uh, if we would say starting magnetization is zero, we would end up with, uh, with a non-magnetic non solution. OK. Uh, let me go back. So I will close this. Uh, so we are now example three, iron. And now we are, there are two input files here inside, iron AFM, and obviously AFM is not the atomic force microscopy, but it means anti-ferromagnetic, right? And FM means ferromagnetic. Okay, so here, okay, first uh, iron is metal, so we have uh, we have uh, this occupation, right? Uh, then uh, it is magnetic, so n spin equal two, and we give some initial guess for iron, zero point six. This starting magnetization is from zero to one or from minus one to one if we have anti menor ferromagnetic. And then as Ralph Gebauer yesterday explained, if you see this US uh, in the name of the pseudo potential, then uh, uh, it is a ultra soft pseudo potential. Okay, and uh, so these are these uh, new variables of today and for this particular example, these two variables. Now, uh, of course, uh, this uh, magnetic business will be handled in more details next week. But nevertheless, let me just show you. So how we do anti-ferromagnetic setup. And uh, so I will open another input file. 
And it is, uh, it is very similar, but there are important differences. Because now in BCC, in the uh, EBRAF3 is BCC, uh, uh, is just one atom per unit cell. And because it's one atom per unit cell, we cannot have two different atoms, right? So we can just, uh, with uh, one atom per unit cell, we can just have ferromagnetic. So if we want to do anti-ferromagnetic, what we need to do, we need to do in a sense a supercell, which is twice bigger. We need at least two atoms in the, in the cell, right? At least two atoms in the cell. And then we can say, okay, one is, uh, let's say spin up and the other is spin down or one is uh, spin red, the other is spin blue, whatever you named it, they have to be different. And so for this reason, what we will do, we will take a primitive cubic, this is Ibra equal one. And then there will be two atoms in the unit cell and they will be labeled differently. You see with the same pseudo potential, but we label it uh, uh, iron one and iron two. And then we have two atoms in the, in the, let's say in the cell, iron one and iron two. And then we start, we say, okay, starting magnetization of iron one is zero six and starting magnetization of iron two so the second iron is minus 0, 06. And with this, we have set up the anti-ferromagnetic structure in a sense. Okay. But for today, okay, you can do later on ex uh, the exercise by, by yourself, but now I will just run the ferromagnetic, the ferromagnetic iron. Okay, and so uh, here, uh, uh, okay, uh, let us just run uh, this calculation. So uh, let me just for once open, let me just for once open the readme file during the exercise. Okay, so I can run the calculation. Oops, didn't work. Okay, I do it. I do it like that. And this is what now I'm doing is another trick for those of you, many of you know this. So this I pipe to T and T will print to the file and to the standard output. And so here, if we look at the output file, you can see that the code prints total magnetization and absolute magnetization. So we see two point something for uh, magneton per cell, which I think is not far from the experimental, from the experimental value because uh, we are now uh, having the magnetic system. Okay, now I think is a, is a time we move on and we go, uh, okay, here you will see the explanation for the antiferromagnetic. I will not do this example, but now we go to the convergence test for the ultra soft pseudo potential. You remember Paolo ex uh, explained this morning, when you have ultra soft pseudo potential uh, for the charge density, you will have two terms. So you will have this, let's say smooth charge density plus augmentation terms. Augmentation uh, terms are much harder uh, and uh, requires a larger cutoff for the, for, the, uh, for, the, for the charge density cutoff. And so here, uh, so what we will do, we will, we will um, uh, scan different combinations of the wave function cutoff and of uh, the charge density cutoff. So these are these two E cut wave function and E cut rho. And uh, so we go with dual. Dual is uh, for historic reasons, uh, because in, in the past, uh, in the very, let's say initial versions, it was uh, E cut wave function and dual. And the definition of dual, you can, you can see here, it is just the wave function cutoff uh, multiplied by dual, and this would be then the cutoff for the charge density. Um, for the charge density, uh, in in the past, so it was a wave function cutoff and dual, and so this is the reason I use here the name dual. And so you see, uh, one feature of uh, the PWTK, you can write mathematical expressions, and so we will loop over a dual, and we will loop over. Uh, uh, over a wave function cutoff. So let me go to example. So this would be example one. Uh, so obviously it's just one script. 
So I open it. It should be the right one, the right one because it's the only one. Okay. So here you see. Uh, uh, so uh, more or less the same as, as before, but maybe a bit longer because we are also collecting collecting the results. So dual from four eight twelve. Four would be default, right? Because if you don't look, do not specify uh, the um, cutoff for the density, it is taken four times that of the wave function, right? So this is here. And eight and twelve is of course a higher number. And then we will scan the uh, uh, wave function cut off, cut off from twenty five with a step of five down to or up to fifty feedbacks. Okay, so this is the script. Let us run it. Now it is running uh, a bit uh, slower because uh, this uh, zoom uh, is uh, taking uh, apparently a sufficient amount of uh, of CPU because when I tested uh, without zoom, it was much faster. Now we are in uh, cut of 45 dual four, so it will take it will take a while. So maybe I should not wait. I think I also have the result in the slides. And the result is here. So you see here the result. And you can see for dual equal four, this is the result. And then for dual equal eight and 12, the basically the two curves uh, coincide. And so what does this tell you? This uh, tells you the following. If I want to use uh, for the ultra soft for this particular case, of course, uh, if I want to use dual of four, then I need to go up with the wave function cutoff to let's say 40 readbacks, because here the two curves starts to coincide, right? But if I use uh, larger cutoff uh, for the density, like eight times or 12 times, then maybe I can go down all the way down to 25 readbacks, and I can use. 25 readbacks for the wave function, and then let's say eight times that, which would be, I think, 200 readbacks for uh, uh, 200 readbacks for the charge density. And uh, so, um, okay, what is the advantage? The advantage is that in uh, in the code itself, there is a lot of uh, the, a lot of uh, operation with the wave function, a lot of FFTs with the wave function, and much less FFTs for the charge densities. So uh, we are doing uh, a lot of business for the wave function and much less business for the for the for the density, which means that if I am able to go down with the cutoff, okay, here now I have the result. If I am able to go down with uh, the cutoff for the wave function, the calculation will run faster. So this is the benefit. So use dual or use uh, uh, cutoff for the charge density, which is eight times or ten times that. You see, for this particular example, eight times is okay. Eight times that for the wave function, and you can go down with the wave function cutoff substantially. So here you can see that this eight and twelve are coinciding. Okay. Uh, okay. So this was uh, about this, um, let's say, uh, business of uh, wave function versus uh, density cutoff uh, when we use ultra soft zero potential, and now. We can do, let's say, some uh, 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 example, uh, or some analysis, some post-processing for the iron, and this will be so. We will plot the density of states and the density of states projected to atomic orbitals. So that we will some uh, we will see some electronic structure of iron, uh, uh, and we will see uh, how this magnetic solution uh, looks like. So we go to this example two, DOS, and uh, okay, you can see readme file, and obviously there is just one script, which is uh, uh, DOS.pwtk. So I open it, and here it says please insert e cut of wave function and e cut row values as determined in the e cut exercise. Okay, let us do it. So I don't know, we could 
let, let us take thirteen meters. And then, of course, we saw that for the cutoff, we need phase times that, right? So I just do as a mathematical expression. Be careful when you do as a mathematical expression, you should not write like that. So it should be together, or else the PWTK will not know how to interpret that. So this works together. This will fail. Okay. And okay, let us just uh, what, what this uh, example is doing. So we load uh, um, uh, input file for the ferromagnetic iron, which has uh, which we have in the parent directory. Then we set the proper wave function cutoff and uh, cutoff uh, for density. We run pw.x calculation, and then we do uh, then we do um, uh, NSF calculation. With a denser mesh, uh, because uh, here, if I look back, let us see what was in this file. It was eight by eight by eight. Here, I just do a slightly denser mesh to have a better dose. I'm using uh, tetrahedral occupations. This is a kind of a, um, occupation which is uh, was not covered today. It is basically taking. Um, the K points, and then it is making a kind of a, um, not a cubes, but a tetrahedra, and then it is interpolating. So if you if you plot, uh, if you plot a mesh, three dimensional mesh, then you can do let's say a little cubes, right, from one to to the next, and then each such cube can be subdivided into six tetrahedra, and then with this occupation tetrahedra, basically uh, we are interpolating between uh, two K points. This tetrahedra sometimes is nice for density of states. And then, okay, so we are uh, running this NSF calculation. Then we are running the DOS calculation. So, okay, maybe this is a new code. You never, uh, you, you didn't see it before. It's uh, super simple. Uh, we can go here. We click uh, DOS. So we see it has one name list, DOS, and here are some variables. It is the prefix and out there by this prefix and out this prefix and out there this pops up more or less everywhere because this prefix and out there tells to the program where are these files that pw.x uh, calculated right when it did uh, this self consistent field calculation and so this prefix and out there will be here for these two weeks so more or less every code not all but majority of them okay and then we do this um, DOS calculation. And then there is another code, which is this wave function, projected wave function. This means you also have it here. This is a similar than DOS code. So DOS, obviously, from the name, it calculates density of states. And then you can plot the density of states. This projected wave function also calculates the density of states, but it calculates density of states projected to atomic uh, orbitals in uh, this particular case to loading orbitals and then you will see later on we can have uh, this dose projected to the iron d states dose projected to the iron s states and and, and, and so on uh, okay so at the end it is uh, also running this and then it is executing a new plot script and we will see we will see uh, the density of states of iron Okay, so let us run this uh, example. Now it's doing SEF. Now it's doing NSEF with a denser, with a denser K-mesh. Now it's calculating the density of states and it will write to our files. Now it is calculating project density of states. And now here is the result. This was the result of uh, this was the result of, of the DOS calculation. So let me try to zoom. So what we see, a majority spin, and this is typically usually how one plot this, uh, let's say, spin, uh, spin polarized cases, let's say spin up. Our majority spin is plotted like positive, and then minority spin uh, or spin down is plotted as negative, and then you can see the two together, right? 
And so uh, you can really see that this is a majority spin. Uh, later, we will also see what is the Fermi energy, and it will be here somewhere. I hope you see my mouse. And so this would be vacant states. And you can really see that with minority spin, we have more vacant states than with majority spin. This just means that in majority spin, more states are occupied than in minority spin. Okay. Uh, now, whoops, I press enter. And now I get a uh, density of states projected to, uh, let's say, uh, uh, atomic S and atomic D states. And this is this is typical uh, iron is transition metal, more or less the electronic structure of transition metal that uh, it is similar uh, in a sense. Well, uh, if you look from the from from the from far, it's similar for all of them. So we have a very flat S band that spans, uh, I don't know, 10, 20, uh, 10 uh, 15, 20, uh, 20 EV. So here it goes from, I don't know, this is five down to 20. It depends how many states we calculate. And, uh, and so uh, you see S, S is this, right? And this. And so in the S state, we have two electrons, right? Per S has two electrons per atom. And so we have these two electrons in, uh, in the range of 20 electron volts, which is why the dose is, is uh, so why this is a bent or why the dose is very low. So it's a very flat right here. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, in the D state, we have 10 electrons and it spans, I don't know, from here to here, this is roughly four electron volts. So with the D state, we have uh, 10 electrons in the range of four electron volts and then it is obvious that the density of states will be quite high. And this is precisely what we are looking at. And typically, uh, in a transition metal, bulk transition metals have a one uh, S electron, uh, one electron in the S band because the Fermi energy would be somewhere here. We will do later on the exercise where is the Fermi energy, somewhere here, which means that roughly half of the band is occupied and half of the S band is uh, empty. Okay. Now uh, to complete the exercise. So here we did, we did not see where the Fermi energy is, right? And now, okay, so uh, how to figure out the Fermi energy? Well, suppose that I am new with uh, the quantum espresso. I don't know how to do it uh, because now everything is prepared. I can look at the readme file and there will be a recipe how to get, how to get the Fermi energy. So one way is that we grab this NSCF file. This is one way. And here I say, I, I got the Fermi energy is 12.8541 uh, uh, electron volts. Other way would be to look at the, at the output file. And maybe this I think was explained uh, today with Paolo. So we can, we can uh, look because now we are dealing with the metal. So we have number of, uh, of atoms in the cell, one. Number of atomic types, one, because it's just iron, right? Number of electrons, it is eight. So how many consham states do I need to, uh, to for uh, eight electrons? Obviously four. Why the code is taking the number of consham states equal eight? Because uh, it is a metal and we specified occupation or we specified explicitly the number of bands. So this is also possible. And I think this was covered yesterday by, by Pietro de Lewis. So you can say number of states is that high. But even for metals, as, for, as soon as you occupy uh, smearing, the code will take some percentage larger number of states than uh, are, uh, let's say, the minimum needed. Then I can go down, I can go down. And I can, uh, so I'm uh, trying to find, where is it? Uh, where is it? For me, for me. Okay, it is printed here. The Fermi energy is, uh, uh, so this the um, output is NSF calculation is a bit uh, different than for the SCF calculation. Another way to find uh, the Fermi energy, I think was also explained yesterday by, uh, Pietro de Lugas is to look at the DOS file and you have it here. You have it here. And now we can edit the GNU plot file. 
So all the nuclear files uh, have the GP extension. All the PWTK scripts has the PWTK extension. All the inputs has a dot in extension. All the shell script has dot S H extension. So this is good to know because by extension you can you can recognize what file it is. And so here you see the instruction set Fermi energy to correct value. Okay, so here I have it. Or if I lost it by now, I look at, at this DOS file. It's here. I put it here. And then I can replot. I can replot. And now we can see this ver vertical line. This is the Fermi energy, and this is more or less where I showed before you with the, with the mouse. And this would be now this uh, this uh, density of states projected to to atomic uh, S and D states. So this basically is uh, density of states projected to uh, to S states and density of states uh, projected to D states. And now you can really see that this is uh, this is uh, vacant. This is uh, not occupied because we have the states occupied only up to Fermi Fermi uh, energy. And with this, you can immediately figure out that this is really the minority spin and this is the majority spin. So I think with this, we have more or less completed completed um, um, the hands-on for today. So here you also have a, a, the explanation of the scheme, how to do this uh, DOS and prior prior wave function calculation. So you have, uh, you need to do, but I already described to you this uh, SCF calculation with non-SCF. We have a denser K-mesh, then we do DOS and projection, project, projected uh, wave function calculation and so on and so forth. So with this, I think uh, I am finished and uh, and uh, if there are some questions, I can answer them. And otherwise, I wish you a um, um, productive afternoon so that you will be able to do those exercises for those of you who did not uh, follow me, who have just listened to me. But I believe that some of you uh, have followed, uh, followed me and have already completed some of those exercises. So um, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Tone. Yes, there are many questions on Slack, which have been answered by other tutors and other speakers. And uh, we have a few questions here in the chat. Do you want me to read them or you do yourself? No, please read. <laughs> read. So, okay, yeah, these are from uh, the streaming, uh, the YouTube uh, streaming channels. So um, the first one is uh, for lattice parameter convergence uh, should not we really oh, no, okay, this is, uh, uh, sorry, this uh, question uh, has been already answered by Paolo here and in the Slack, so we can go uh, ahead. Uh, should we do K-point convergence, uh, ECAT convergence before or after this relax uh, starting from the experimental structure? So okay. uh, the, the, the previous question was whether to perform uh, the difference between relax and VC relax. Um, and Paolo answered, relax does not change the cell volume, VC relax does. It's an alternative procedure. For simple materials, the equation of state is simple and effective. And then the, quest, the following question is, should we do the K-point convergence, ECAT convergence before or after? BC relax, starting from the experimental structure. So I think that in this particular case, I think that the answer is, is relatively simple. Uh, so even if you take, so for example, we treated silicon and we treated um, iron, uh, and we treated aluminum. So uh, as far as uh, K point uh, is, uh, are concerned, if you take a uh, experimental lattice parameter and you, you do a K point test, I think that, that that will do. That will do. Of course, the true lattice parameter will be a bit uh, different, but I don't think this will change. Uh, this will affect uh, the, the K point convergence. Uh, so, uh, as far as the cutoff is concerned, it really does not depend on the structure because it's more atomic property. So, the cutoff for the wave function depends on which pseudo potentials you take. So now for iron, we took ultra soft pseudo potential. If we would uh, take a norm conserving, the cutoff would be much higher. 
And this cutoff is atomic, uh, so it depends on the pseudo potential. And the lattice parameter doesn't really have a role here. So I think that uh, for both, uh, of course, uh, maybe we, uh, with these k points, we can uh, uh, we need to have some provision. If if I compress the structure, and for example, the structure becomes metallic, then yes, uh, then uh, of course this k point convergence uh, can be significantly affected because uh, uh, we can go from uh, non-metal to metal. But these are let's say special cases. Normally, I would say that this. Uh, K point convergence does not, uh, let's say, critically depend on the lattice parameter and taking uh, experimental lattice parameter would be just fine. This would be my answer to this. Okay. Is and is it convenient, is it convenient to do the convergence of ICAT raw? We've done that. We've done that. This was this dual. So, and uh, the answer is here. Uh, so, Dual. So dual is, let me open a window because you can still see my, uh, uh, so we have E cut wave function, right? This is for the wave function, right? And then we have E cut rho. E cut rho. This is for the charge density, right? But here in this example, what we had, so here is a, uh, here is a e cut wave function for different duals. And so, as I explained, e cut rho, e cut rho equal e cut wave function times dual. So, basically, what we are looking at this plot is uh, uh, we could also plot this in two dimensions if we would, uh, if uh, in kind of uh, um, plot in. Uh, well, basically projection of uh, the three-dimensional surface projected to two dimension. So basically what we are looking at this plot here is a uh, wave function cutoff and then each curve here means a different, in a sense, a different uh, uh, E cut row, right? Because, okay, but it's case. So uh, for example, for, for dual equal four, this would mean, uh, this would mean 100 read back for E cut row. Here it would mean 120 Rydberg for uh, ECAT row, and of course 30 Rydberg for ECAT wave function, and so on and so forth. This point here, so let me, no, now I need to, okay, suppose that this is a, a 12 curve, right? So this point here, the cutoff row is 12 times 25. This point here is 12 times 30. So in a sense, we're doing this, we have run both E cut row and E cut wave function test, and we have determined that let's say with dual eight, we can uh, use uh, uh, E cut wave function of 25. And so at 25 with dual eight, this means that E cut row would be 200, right? So this we did in a sense. Thank you. Uh, another question from Streaming, uh, thanks, well understood, I agree, maybe it is. Okay, this was still related to the VC relax. And uh, I think, okay, here another one from streaming for systems with more than 100 atoms. Can you do VC relax at gamma point? Okay, I, I think uh, so. If you remember the talk of uh, Ralph Gebauer yesterday, uh, he, pl he plotted uh, these, um, I think at a given point, these K points, right? Is a Brian in the zone. And that, now, the larger the unit cell, right? The larger the lattice parameters of, of, of the unit cell, the smaller are the reciprocal lattice vectors. The smaller are the reciprocal lattice vector, the smaller is the Brian zone, the less K points you need. Now, if you, if you go to, back to the talk of Ralph Gebauer, where he plotted these um, uh, K points, and now imagine that you shrink uh, the, the uh, Brian zone, which means that less and less and less and less uh, K points are there. And this implies, yes, for a very big supercell, you can take a gamma point. So a single K point, if you are, Supercell is uh, so super big, uh, single K point is sufficient, so you can take gamma point. 
but of course so uh, what would be what would be uh, again this is something that needs to be tested and suppose that we have for a cubic for a cubic uh, for a cubic uh, unit cell this is super simple suppose that my lattice parameter is a right and for this a lattice parameter we saw that uh, we needed, let's say, for aluminum 12 uh, K points, right? Now, suppose that I do a supercell and I do, uh, I do a 2A by 2A by 2A uh, supercell. Now, because my supercell is twice bigger, this means that the Brian zone will be twice smaller per direction. So I can take 12 divided by two for the two by two by two. So I can take six by six by six. Now I imagine I go to three by three by three supercell. A three times larger uh, cell means a three times uh, smaller Brian zone per direction. So I can go to 12 divided by three. So four by four by four would be fine, right? Then I go to four by four by four supercell, which means 12 by four. So three by three by three K points would be okay. And now you see, this is the reason why I like 12 by 12 by 12 K mesh so much, because it has a lot of uh, these uh, divisors. So uh, you can divide by two, you can divide by three, you can divide by four, you can divide by six, which means that if you go from a unit cell to a two by two by two supercell, to a four by four, to a six by six, you can, uh, you can, Figure out what would be the uh, what would be the uh, equivalent k meshes. So for six a supercell, two k points would be enough. But if I do twelve a supercell, then at this point, because I, I saw that for example aluminum uh, uh, twelve by twelve by twelve k mesh is enough. If my supercell is twelve by twelve by twelve. This implies that I can easily take a single K point and I will be at the same precision as for the unit cell that, uh, when I use 12 by 12 by 12 K mesh. Thank you. Uh, another question, uh, of course, for participants, since uh, now Tona has finished the, the explanation, you can write here on Zoom if you want some questions to be uh, explain the uh, voice uh, by tone, or otherwise you write on Slack uh, in the way you are doing so far. So here, another question here, for which total energy difference should I consider the calculation as converged? Is there a rule of, or a rule of thumb or some safe value that I can be satisfied with? Okay, this is, this is, uh, uh, this is, um in a sense, a tough question, which does not have a single answer. Uh, let's say that as a rule of thumb, if you converge to a milli Rydberg per atom, this should be more or less okay. But uh, so uh, this should be tested in principle, this should be tested for every property that you're interested in. It, it depends on the context, right? It depends on the context. Now I wanted to say something more here I had in my, uh, but now I forgot what I wanted to say. It's another issue, but I just forgot. It's another issue. Uh, it's another issue. Ivan, can you repeat the question? Maybe sure, I sure. For which total energy difference should I consider the calculation as converged? Is there a rule of thumb or some safe value that I can be satisfied with? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so as I said, it depends on the context. So maybe one millimeter per atom, but then you can test for every property you're interested in. But so even, uh, I'm sorry, because I, I wanted to tell something more, but now I forgot what. So I cannot remember, I'm sorry. Yeah, sure. Even, yes. even the okay. question didn't help. If, if I will remember, then I will write on the Slack. Okay, sure. no problem. The question is also posted on Slack on day two, channel uh, May 18. There is, there is something more I, I wanted to tell, but I'm really sorry I forgot why I was speaking. Yeah, yeah, sure. We have Slack and uh, many other occasions. Uh, so, yeah, no problem. Yeah. As, uh, ah, uh, now I remember. Now I remember. Uh, so, suppose that you have a semi core states uh, in uh, that you treat semi core states uh, explicitly. Then these are, these are uh, very hard usually. 
And if you would, uh, if you would uh, want to converge the energy to within a milli Rydberg per atom, then this would require a super high um, cutoff, right? In such cases, maybe you can do another test. So you're interested, I don't know, in, uh, in the structure or you're interested in, in the cell volume. You can, instead of doing a convergence test with respect to the total energy, for such a pseudo potential with the semi core states uh, treated explicitly, you can uh, uh, do a convergence test with respect to, I don't know, lattice parameter, with respect to forces, with respect to, to, to the property you are interested in. Thank you. Uh, so another one, thanks, Sir, for this great presentation. Can we optimize the atomic position and keep unit cell? I guess, yeah. Yeah, this is, so this is a question that is answered, uh, that will be answered tomorrow. Tomorrow, uh, so uh, in the morning, you will have a lecture about relaxation, about variable cell relaxation, about NAP, uh, and then in the afternoon, uh, in, uh, in the hands-on session, Ari will present, uh, will present the relaxation, variable cell relaxations, and, uh, and uh, also NAP calculation. And now I think here the answer depends. If you are calculating, um, let's say like we did today, uh, silicon or aluminum or, uh, or uh, iron, which are uh, cubic structures, right? Uh, so we can just scan, uh, we can do a scan over the lattice parameter. And this is quite efficient and is usually, is usually okay. Now, if you have a unit cell, which is uh, not cubic, which is three clinic, for, uh, for example, which has A, B, C, alpha, beta, gamma. Then of course you have six parameters to optimize. And then I think in this case, I would uh, highly opt for a variable cell relaxation. Thanks again. So another here, thank you for the, for the beautiful presentation. What is the criteria for categorizing magnetic materials as ferromagnetic or antiferromagnetic? with respect to the total magnetization, absolute magnetization and magnetic moment. Okay, so I think that a majority of this will be handled next week because there is a, a magnetism day. So, uh, but uh, if we just stick to this iron example, right? So if, if, all, if all the magnetic moments are pointing, let's say in one direction, uh, then this would be ferromagnetic. With the anti-ferromagnetic, we have kind of, uh, let's say one pointing up, one atom, the magnetic moment was pointing up for the next uh, atom magnetic moment was uh, pointing down. And then of course, then if you do the sum, you would get zero. So anti-ferromagnetic, the net magnetic moment of anti-ferromagnetic material is zero. If you consider this anti-ferromagnetic iron, one atom up, the other atom down, right? And uh, so I think that for today, this should be more or less uh, uh, enough uh, explanation because more will be next week. Maybe just the difference between uh, total and uh, absolute magnetization. So the total magnetization, I think is you do the sum, you do the sum and for uh, anti-ferromagnetic it is a zero. And absolute is you take the absolute values of each, uh, of each, uh, of each, uh, a magnetic of each uh, moment. And that means even for uh, anti-ferromagnetic, if you take the absolute values, right, plus minus, it, there would be just absolute and it would have uh, the code would print uh, this absolute magnetic moment would not be zero, but total magnetic moment would be zero. Okay, so another question from the streaming now, how can I include the electric field effects in the input file? The electric field effects, okay, these, uh, I don't know whether this will even be covered. So I think it is better that I show, that I show here. There are some uh, variables like uh, this uh, deep field and, uh, and uh, uh, this uh, uh, TEF field and so, so, so there is a, uh, series of variables. So I suppose that this, uh, uh, so you want to put, uh, suppose you have a surface and you want to put uh, uh, your surface in a magnetic field uh, and then, or you want to do a diaper correction. <clears throat> it is a similar thing. 
it is uh, related to this deep field, but there is a series of there is a series of variables that you need uh, to to let's say plug in in order to have uh, this uh, electric field or uh, this um, dipole correction um, activated. And uh, so maybe I will write answer later on on the Slack how you can do that. Okay. Because it's, uh, it's, uh, it's something that uh, even I need to look because there are uh, five or so variables, four, three variables that yeah. I don't know by, by, uh, by heart, I need to look at uh, it. So I will post the answer to, to yes. Slack. So here we have, uh, I, I, I don't see any other question from the streaming. Uh, yes, the last one was this one about the electric field effects. Here in the chat, uh, I see this question. Can you please repeat how did you extract the plot from uh, frog from PW guy? But yeah. I think that if uh, Mal, you post this on Slack, you could receive more um, direct assistance or, yeah. and it's, I don't know, Tony, what do you think? Because but uh, for I this PW GUI, I can show this is trivial. So I can... Okay. Again, okay. so if somebody didn't uh, uh, catch this, uh, maybe it will. It okay, will... okay, please go ahead. So you open it, and now suppose so the question was referred to this uh, plot number, right? And plot number, so you pick the right. Okay, so you this means new here, right? Create new, or you go here. New PP input. Okay, and now here you see this plot number, right? And suppose I want Psi square, I click Psi square, and then I go to view, input file, and I have it here. And typically, this is how I use it. Then I just copy with mouse to my input file. So I copy this, and I put into my input file. Another useful feature, because this PW, PW GUI is a kind of um, input builder, right? Another useful feature, uh, maybe for the beginners is, uh, with, okay, for the pw.x. Now, of course, here in pw.x, there are hundreds of variables, and this is confusing. Maybe you cannot find. Maybe this, uh, maybe uh, for the pw, uh, this, uh, uh, this is better. Uh, here you can search and you can find, right? But there is one feature here, which is very, very uh, useful, which is very useful. And this is the following. Here you see I have a type of calculation. If I click self-consistent field, and then I go to view, input file, I see the structure of the input file for SEF calculation. So this tells me, okay, I need a control name list. I need a system name list. I need electrons name list. I need uh, atomic species, atomic positions, and I need a key points. So these are the fields that I need. Now let us go to relax, ionic relaxation. And maybe just one, uh, one um, explanation here, because uh, I noticed that students who are new, they are um, many times confused with what is this ionic relaxation? Do we want to do uh, sodium cation and chloride anion? And the answer is no. Ion. Also, we have the name list ions. This is a pseudo potential jargon because in a pseudo potential, we do not have a true atoms. We have a pseudo atoms because we are treating uh, nucleus plus these uh, core states implicitly. And this then can be seen as an ion. So basically, in a pseudo potential jargon, ion would mean atom or a nucleus, right? Uh, because I know that students are sometimes confused with this word ion. Now, this ionic relaxation then means that I want to relax the structure of, or, or if you want, uh, this is a, a relaxation of a molecule, a relaxation of, a, of, a, of a coordinates within the unit cell or so on. And now, so I ticket this relax calculation, and now I see the structure of the input file. Now you see, before, for SEF calculation, there was no ions name list. Now I ticket uh, relax, and I have the ions name list. Right? Now, if I do VC relax, this will be tomorrow, you will notice that not only I have ions name list, but I also need cell name list. Now, the name list can be empty, which means that the fault values will be used, but it needs to be there. 
Another thing, now let us go to here, system, and let me pick e brow equals zero, which means free lattice. So I, free lattice means that I will specify the lattice parameters, the lattice vectors myself. Now, in this case, I go to input file. Okay, I see brow equals zero, and I have a cell parameters cart. So here I will specify a lattice cell vectors, right? So by doing this, so maybe using for BW that is, is confusing because it's too many variables, but at least at the beginning, if you use it, you can have the idea what is the structure of the input file for a given calculation on, let's say, for a given for a given uh, uh, Braille-wise uh, lattice. And so suppose that I that I tick uh, here cubic, and you see I just need to specify CLDM of one, and there are two different ways how I can specify the lattice parameters for the predefined lattices. One is via cell DM, which means cell dimension. And then this is specified in bar, uh, in bar units. Or we are A, B, C, cosinus A, B, cosinus A, C, cosinus B, C. So one or the other, you cannot mix. And so for cubic, you see, I need to specify A. Now let us go to some, I don't know, triclinic, tri, uh, triclinic or monoclinic. You see, for monoclinic, I need to specify A, B, C, and cosinus A, B. And maybe for triclinic, the answer is uh, clear. For triclinic, I need to specify all the six lattice parameters. So maybe for this, uh, uh, this graphical user interface is, uh, is, uh, is useful. OK. So thank you very much, Tony. I think uh, we have answered all questions because we have no more questions from streaming. And uh, of course, on Slack, I think that all, almost all questions have been answered. But of course, they if they, they are not now, they will be in the next few minutes or hours. So be uh, for sure, everyone who posts on Slack will, uh, will receive an answer. So no problem for that. And uh, I don't see uh, any other question here. Is um, okay. Yes. So maybe yeah. We are. It's uh, it's time to close now. It's twelve thirty almost. Uh, so if you have more uh, more questions, because maybe you will keep doing the exercises in the next uh, minutes or hours. So if you have troubles, you still want to ask something. Of course, as usual, post it on Slack and uh, you will receive an answer. So keep, we can keep using the Slack channel. Thank you very much, Tone. And um, here I, there, there, are, there is plenty of messages here. I didn't uh, read them all, but there are plenty of messages with uh, extremely clear presentation. Thank you so much. Amazing presentations here very much. Thank you. So really thank you, Tone, for this presentation. and. Uh, we will meet again, uh, again with the Tone and Pietro De Lugas tomorrow, uh, 8.30 here on Zoom. So uh, good afternoon or good evening or good morning, uh, whatever, uh, to everyone. And uh, yeah, goodbye. See you tomorrow. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.